All right, we'll call the meeting to order. We are here on Tuesday, September 6, 2022, for Freeport Town Council meeting number 17 22 here in Council Chambers. Start with a roll call tonight. We have Councillor Pillsbury present, Councillor Fournier here, Councillor Lawrence here, Councillor Daniele here, Councillor Egan here, and Chair Pilch is here. Councillor Bradley is excused due to illness. So please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Our second order of business is to waive the reading of the minutes of our last meeting, number 15-22, which was held on August 2nd, a month ago, uh, and meeting 16-22, held on August 16th, which was a short meeting, uh, and to accept those minutes as printed. So moved. Second. Thank you, Councillor Daniele and Councillor Lawrence. Any discussion? Hearing none. Uh, I'll call for a vote. All in favor of accepting the minutes. Aye. That's everybody. Aye. That's unanimous. So we'll move on to our third order of business. I have two announcements tonight. Uh, one is that there is still time to run for office. Nomination papers for the November 2022 municipal election are available for the following <coughs> offices in the town of Freeport. Uh, town Council at Large and Town Council District 1. Sewer District. Uh, there are two seats for the sewer district. Water district has one seat open. Uh, the RSU has two seats open. Those are all three-year terms. In addition, the RSU also has one seat that's open for a two-year term. Uh, papers are due back to the town clerk September 14th, 2022. Uh, and lastly, the Friends of the Freeport Community Library uh, are hosting a book sale September 23rd through the 25th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m with a preview on September 22nd from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m., uh, which is $20 per family or $10 with a Freeport library card. Book sale volunteers can attend the preview night at no charge. They have lots of great programs lined up for the fall, including musical performances for children and adults. Visit freeportlibrary.com or their Facebook page for more information. That's all I have for announcements. Anyone else have announcements? Councillor Egan. I uh, just want to remind folks coming up at the end of September on Sunday the 25th is a really interesting event happening at the high school here in town in Freeport. Uh, it is National Drive Electric Week. So if you have any interest or even inquiries about electric vehicles and electric um, home improvement um, devices such as lawnmowers and chainsaws and heat pumps to heat and cool your home, um, this is an expo to come and find out from all kinds of different vendors users you'll be able to test drive an electric car if you'd like and ask uh, the owners questions so um, it's a wide open event for the public on sunday the 25th at the high school that's september 25th at the freeport high school <coughs> thank you anyone else have announcements no i do have a question though yeah. do we need to accept the minutes from the second uh we i think the motion was to accept them both ah the Never mind, I missed that part. August 16th, yeah. <coughs> but good question. Do you have an announcement to make? Oh, no, by all means. We're having a public safety open house on October 12th from 5 to 7 p.m. October 12th. Yep. At the public safety building, I assume? Public safety building, right? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> and thank all of you. I'm just. I just put that in to basically get save the date, you know, with uh, Fire Prevention Week, you know, Open House. It's been a uh, police and fire rescue uh, event and uh, well attended, but it's gone away for the last couple of years, so it's time to bring it back. So I just want to get the dates out there, start broadcasting it, so thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thanks for bringing it back. Um, Next up, we have information exchange. It's been a while since we were all sitting up here, so I imagine there's probably information to exchange. Who wants to start? Council Fournier. Uh, I've had a couple of really positive comments on the work uh, that was done down to the mass landing and the boat launch. Uh, <coughs> the only question 
that uh, they had, and I think, Peter, you told me they're working on getting a uh, some sort of float out there at some point, but that is uh, that is a huge improvement, and uh, uh, so congratulations to Public Works who did that. It certainly looks a lot better. Yep, they did a fantastic job. Thanks for everybody that's, I've got a lot of comments on it, actually. The ramp had to be taken out because it was never permitted when it was installed sometime in the past 20 years. We can put a permit application in. We're going to do that in the near future, but that needs a little bit more actual design work for it. So, yep, uh, not a ramp, a float, a finger float next to. We we've talked about that. So, anyone else have any new changes in the last is five six weeks? Huh? Summer. Yeah, yeah, summer. We've all been after COVID. Yeah. Um, August is I know, uh, I know Mary's on the call to give us an update on the downtown vision. Um, and I do have one request as you listen to what Mary says. We'd like to do a, uh, a schedule a workshop on the 27th, which is not one of our regular Tuesdays, but one of the in-between Tuesdays. Uh, the idea being that we could uh, hear what this task force has been up to, invite the public to attend and have a bit of a discussion before we start to kind of you know, bring it up here to, to vote on things. Uh, so that would be the idea is to have that on the 27th at 6 o'clock. So save the date on that. And um, you won't be around either? Okay. I'll check with you guys after because I know uh, we're missing some others as well. So if that's not the right date, we might need to shift it. Um, and the only announcement I have is um, I was in touch with uh, Caroline uh, and have been watching the planning board meetings. And they are close to wrapping up their work on the land use part of the marijuana ordinances. So they can say where it's going to be and under what conditions and things like that. Once they're done, we still have some work to do to talk about licensing and registration. So how many we give out, what are the permits, what are the costs, things like that. So the planning board can't do that. That's stuff we have to do. Uh, so the, the sort of question to you guys is, do you, is there an appetite to start that work now rather than wait until they get done and then start discussing the license and registration stuff? If you guys uh, are on board with that, I would suggest maybe we do that at ordinance and kind of come up with a recommendation or two to bring back to you guys saying, hey, here's here's a proposal for how we might do that. Yep. So uh, I'm getting a couple of nods, mm -hmm. three nods, four nods. Like uh, yeah, okay. All right. So I'll we'll see if we can get that going on ordinance committee so we can do that in parallel. Um, that's all I had. So unless there's anything else, I'll go to Mary, who I think is online. There's Mary. Oh, there's Mary. Mary, if you can hear us. Why don't you take the stage and give us an update on what's been going on from the downtown vision stuff. Okay, here we go. Hi, Mary Davis, president of Freeport Economic Development Corp and all things downtown visioning. Um, well, while the summertime has been going on, we've been introducing lots of people into Freeport to shop. The downtown visioning group has continued to really make a lot of interesting and fun progress. Um, as Dan just talked about, there's quite a large group of um, representatives from all of our project groups across Freeport who have been coming together once a month to talk about the priorities that their groups would like to take on for the downtown visioning. It's been really uh, heartwarming and exciting to see so many people so passionate about the things that they want to do for that the strategy. So what we chose to do is to bring those priorities back to the public for another one of our nice town hall meetings like we did during the downtown visioning. So on 9:27, as Dan talked about at six o'clock, we'll be um, bringing forth all of the priorities that the groups have come about. The groups will be there. I'd like to invite the council to be there. And we're also going to have a wonderful announcement um, that's kind of a secret until then that also supports the downtown vision will be introduced that night. So please, on 927, book your calendars for 6 o'clock, and you'll be able to come see and talk to some of the folks who have been really excited about the, the projects for the downtown strategy. So a couple things that um, we have been working on, the first one that you're gonna see this evening is both the vision support and FED truly support the planning board recommendation that you'll hear about tonight to adjust the required parking on multi-unit housing. Uh, this is truly in support of the idea of wanting downtown housing that would bring more vitality to our businesses, more people on the streets, um, and just overall health at the downtown. So it's a great way to support that through, um, through requiring this new parking of one space per unit. 
Um, I think the planning board did a great job of this. In other towns, they don't require any parking. We decided not to do it that way. And we really support the way the planning board has come across with, with requiring one space per unit. So you'll see that being set for a public hearing tonight. Um, the second thing that there's a lot of focus on is on housing. And uh, Councillor Egan had reached out to me, and I think he'll be talking about that tonight, um, that later this month, um, the council will have um, a, a forum on housing. But in talking to the FEDC board, what we decided to do is to move forward with helping to collect data and information that will help the town of Freeport really decide um, and look at all the information on how much housing do we have, how much have we, you know, what is the average price of the cost of sale? Um, and so in doing that, I'm working with a group of people to pull together some metrics and data to be able to bring to the council and to Freeport. Um, so that information is coming from everyone, like um, we've talked to Marita, which is the real estate in Maine. We've looked at MLS data, um, I've talked to Maura Pillsbury, Matt Peters tomorrow, Linda Berger tomorrow, and some state experts, again, to talk about what does not only aff affordable housing has a lot of different terms. And of course, affordability is based upon an individual. So we wanna make sure we have affordable, affordable housing for all different ranges of housing. Um, and there's a lot of interesting information about Freeport that the cost of housing is generally high. So. Um, here's a little factoid for you. MLS tells us that sales of homes in the last year, 72% of them have been over $500,000 in Freeport. So at any rate, so I'm trying to bring information to the council and to the town of Freeport to help us make the decision about what's the kind of housing that we need. Um, because as you know, there's two housing projects that are in gear right now. Um, and that will support one of the gaps that I see in the housing, but not all of the gaps. So I think it's important for us to think about how we, as a town, look at all the gaps that are there. Um, so with this focus on housing, there's a couple of projects um, that are, one have already has gone through the project review board at 64 rental units in Freeport. That one has gone, got its second approval. Um, and I'm really excited to see this moving forward. The second project that the PRB uh, board reviewed before, they're gonna come back in front of the PRB board with a completely redesigned look um, for the lot that's right beside Town Hall. It's now lovely and really looks like it belongs in Freeport. So again, both of those are rental units that would be market level rental. And we're also getting inquiries now from other groups who are interested in housing and the supporting restaurants and things that would support housing. So I think bringing housing into Freeport based upon what the visioning and what everyone said we needed to do is the right first step because it's bringing interest and activity in other areas. So very exciting for us. Um, and along with that, we can see that there's new businesses that are coming in town. Tonight, you'll see that the bake shop, Good Fire are asking for um, permits. Lint did an expansion um, of a new uh, chocolate shop and hot chocolate shop in the Freeport Village Station that was this past week, which is really exciting. Um, so again, new businesses interested in coming into Freeport based upon our focus on these downtown visioning things. Um, a couple of other small updates. Um, the, this is around bringing new people and helping our current businesses in downtown. We have, uh, FEDC has implemented a client relationship system and there is a survey that's going out to all businesses in Freeport this week asking what do they want and what do they need so that we can help accommodate their needs in downtown as well. Pretty exciting. And the last thing is that GP Cog has reached out to us and said that housing and retail um, are big issues really across uh, Maine. And they would like us to do um, an open workshop with their members to talk to them about how we got the Freeport downtown vision done um, they're interested in this because they see not only have we done the visioning, but also we're trying to enact um, actions to help blow it to life. So pretty exciting to be recognized by GPCOG as moving forward and getting planning and actions done. So that's all for downtown visioning update this month. It's been a busy couple of months and we're excited to see progress moving forward. Thanks to everyone who's been involved in this. There's many, many hands working on it. Awesome. Thank you, Mary. I love that. That's such a long update because it just means there's so much stuff going on and it's all good stuff. So I appreciate that. It does. It really does. There's a lot of people that are spending many, many hours on making these things happen. So 
very exciting. For sure, yeah, yeah, definitely. And the uh, new Lynn store is, uh, I can vouch for the fact that it's bigger and it's got really yummy chocolate, so. <laughs> yes, now they even have more. It does. <clears throat> yes, and, and ice cream. And, and, and hot, hot chocolate, and right, and sorbet and ice cream, yum, yum, yum. Mm. Do they have butter beer too? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet, they don't have a liquor license. <laughs> I was going to say, you'd happen to give him a liquor license tonight, I think, for that. <laughs> Any questions for Mary before we let her go? <clears throat> Back to the grind and doing all the hard work. All right, super. Thanks again, Mary. Thank you all. I appreciate all your support. Thank you. All right. No, if there's no other information to exchange, I'll turn it over to our town manager for the town manager's report. Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, so for tonight's edition here, I've uh, brought a couple members of our illustrious, well, a big chunk of our illustrious fire department here. Um, and I want to take this opportunity uh, to give our chief some credit and also uh, to introduce the new members of the command team, or at least the current new members of the command team uh, over at our fire department. As many of you know, or some of you know, I guess, um, when Paul came on board, one of the reasons that uh, I think Paul and I ended up agreeing on a lot um, when we selected him to be chief or kind of his vision for the department, um, specifically the middle management um, of the department where he wanted to take it for years. We had kind of had talks with different people about, oh, there should be, you know, a supervisory level, there should be captains, there should be lieutenants, and no one really uh, got something down. So Paul and I started working on this, and I think right about the time uh, he was confirmed by the council as fire chief, we had a, a working plan maybe, a, a, a disaster in progress of how we could uh, organize the department shift-wise shift, uh, shift -wise with shift supervision. And uh, I'm happy to report that we are not all the way there yet, but we are well, about halfway there maybe in uh, hiring our management team, the supervisors team over there. So uh, you all know Paul. Paul Conley is the, the chief. Uh, Eric Sylvain's in the back. Eric's our deputy chief, one of our two deputy chiefs. But I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce um, our newest deputy chief who was just hired a week ago, two weeks ago, uh, or confirmed two weeks ago, and that's uh, Scott Smith, who's right here uh, in the middle there in the front. And uh, two of our newly uh, minted, well, I shouldn't say that, Rick uh, Pierce on the right has worked for us um, in a shift capacity for many years. He is here now full time and has taken a position as a shift supervisor captain um, with us. Um, so, and Mike Hansen, who has also worked for us, maybe not for 20 plus years like Rick, but for quite some time, uh, Mike is our other newly minted shift supervisor uh, captain. So really excited about this team coming together and just some of the progress we've seen over there. Um, and a lot more that I hope uh, is to come. I know we've got a couple more of the opportunity over the next few years to hire a few more potential supervisors and then some rank and file medic firefighters um, to round out kind of the coverage team. Um, it's not what we are seeing here isn't necessarily more people on the ground shift wise. It's uh, hiring more full time people and less part time uh, reliance on uh, per diem and shift coverage, which I see you guys. Well, all three of you did uh, for uh, quite some time have done for us so um, kind of it's great to see the people who have been doing that work the grunt work the part-time work step up take full-time positions and really commit to our town which I'm thrilled about so I know Paul might have a few words maybe a presentation that he wants to do here but I want to give Paul some credit and Eric as well for taking the taking the opportunity on these guys and uh, really moving <laughs> trying and moving the department forward at least uh, about halfway forward to where we need to be we think so Thanks, Paul. You want to take it away? Yeah. Thank you, Peter, for the words. Appreciate that. Uh, I come back. I come on back in, um, you know, full time as your chief in uh, December, and uh, basically this has been a work in progress. It's been a tough road. You know, the workforce, labor force is shallow out there. We went through a number of things. Both, all three of them, sat through a, you know, interview process and uh, questioning and answer period and so forth. But basically having them part of our organization for the years that they've been part, we've got to see them in action, their work, their thought process. And it just was fitting that they step forward to say, yes, I'm interested in that. And uh, through the process, um, we're selected as uh, captains and uh, deputy. Just a little bit about each of them is, Mike's been with us for about 15 years. He's an advanced EMT, uh, very level-headed uh, and uh, committed to the department. He's got a uh, communication background, so there's going to be talent uh, there who work with us as we work with our dispatch centers and stuff on process improvement. So he's very familiar with the uh, EMD process. So 
uh, that's a plus for us. Rick Pierce, been with us, uh, well, I've been here 26 years, Rick's been here 26 years, um, and uh, full time, uh, now come on board as full time, paramedic firefighter as well, uh, as well as, uh, I don't know how many years in Portland you've had experience with, so, so very well rounded um, and uh, dedicated to the department and uh, so forth. And our new deputy, Scott Smith, Scott comes with to us with over 20 years of uh, EMS experience and fire experience uh, and is working in a variety number of uh, positions across the country. He's an EMS educator and he's got well over 20. He's also a family nurse practitioner so he brings another dimension of medical education to us and references and contacts in the uh, medical community. So this is just you know a good part of the team. Uh, we've got a couple more to fill shift captains and ongoing process uh, with that. So tonight, um, basically with the help of uh, Deputy Sylvain, is uh, one of the symbolic things as far as in the fire service is the shield of our helmets, identifying us as, as officers, our rank, our number, our rank, so forth. And uh, so we were able to take and uh, move that a little bit forward, get, get some shields in here and do this tonight. Uh, I just think it's a good practice just to recognize uh, you know our folks as we do and introduce them to our town leadership that uh, you should feel comfortable with uh, what we do so uh, with that is uh, Mike Chief. Thank you. and thank you all for your support to the fire department so, Captain Pierce <laughs> yeah, this is a new one. <laughs> yeah, we just had to use a borrowed one. Yeah, because yours was already on. This is already on this helmet. I wasn't going to sneak out and get it off. So. And then our new deputy chief, Scott Smith. Congratulations, welcome aboard. Thanks. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You're Peter, you want to put them in the lights here so they get better light? I've got great contrast on this. You do? All right. Famous last words. There you go. Looks great. Thank you all. Yeah, and so thank you. Once again, I want to thank you for your support of the fire department uh, and the rescue. And uh, we continually to serve and we get good kudos from the public and, and so forth. So I'm proud of our guys and girls on the department. Um, and uh, everybody's doing a fantastic job. And again, thank you for your support. Chief, yeah. former chief, <laughs> retired chief. Thank you. I, uh, <coughs> congratulations. You guys have good talent there. Uh, the only question I have is you've been in the department 26 years and Captain Pierce. How come you got more gray hair than he does? Because <laughs> he's chief. Do you really want me to answer that? <laughs> Probably because I gave it to him. No, yeah. no I work for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you, Chief thanks Conley, so much, for, Chief. for doing thanks that, so. and thanks for coming to the meeting. And, and it's a set of credentials there. Yeah. I know you get a lot of kudos when you actually show up on a scene or at somebody's house, but really it's, you know, the, the days that you're not showing up but you're available, and just knowing that you guys are out there is sort of a huge asset to the town. So on behalf of everybody in town, thank you for all you do and, and for stepping up to step into the positions you did tonight. So it's awesome. All thank right, well, you. Thank you again. Thanks. I'll see you a little bit later. Oh, yeah, that's right, yeah. Your work here is not done. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Anything else you have, Mr. Manager? I mean, I could take another 15 minutes to introduce some other employees, but I think I'll let us get along with the meeting. How about that, Mr. Chair? That sounds like All a right. fine plan. Uh, so next up would be our public comment period. Uh, so, if, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so. <laughs> Unplug the puck, he said. Just plug, <laughs> plug it into the extension, he said. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I just probably blew everyone's eardrums at home. So Apologies for those listening at home. I apologize. Uh, the, uh, so public comment period. We have uh, anybody from the public who wants to step up and address the council uh, can do so. I'm flipping through to see if there are any public hearings tonight or any other items that yeah, we expect couple, to take public, public hearings, comment so. on. Um, but if there's something up that's not uh, up for public hearing tonight uh, that you want to speak about, by all means, come up. Uh, tell us who you are, where you live, what you want to talk about. 
and then we'll go to, to Zoom after this if there's anybody waiting on Zoom. Welcome. Hi. Good Hi. Uh, my name is Chris Palmer. I live at uh, 34 Harmony Lane. Uh, my wife and I actually just um, beginning of August moved into a newly constructed home on Harmony Lane. Uh, I believe my, many of you at the council remember being um, key in getting us a consent agreement signed so that we get a building permit um, for an alleged subdivision violation. I don't know if you remember that from last year. Um, I just want to take a moment and thank you all. Um, my wife and I attended via Zoom, um, listened to the meetings, your thoughtful consideration, discussions, um, your efforts to move us forward to a resolution so we could finally build our home. Um, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, that being said, I honestly can't say that I feel the same way about the whole process to get to where we are today. Um, this cost us a year and a small fortune and additional expenses, out of pocket costs that we weren't planning for. Um, I, I do have a few things that I would like to comment on, if I may, while I have the time sure. tonight. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is the consent agreement itself. When our attorney was drafting the initial draft of that agreement, um, at that point we had already been delayed three or four months from the time we applied and she applied for the permit. I asked my attorney to include language of the agreement to avoid any further delays so that when the agreement was executed, we would get our building permit. Um, that language is in the agreement today, the one that's recorded and executed. Um, in June, I received um, several emails from the town manager, Mr. Joseph, regarding the status of the consent agreement as far as getting signatures and whatnot. Um, June 1st, he said that he instructed Nick to have the permit ready to issue. Uh, I believe June 20, uh, June 24th received another one saying that uh, we had one signature we were waiting for. Everyone else assigned. Building permit was ready to issue as soon as it received. Uh, July 8th, we finally received the final email from Mr. Joseph saying that uh, we finally had all the signatures. Um, the agreement was being uh, recorded at the Registry of Deeds. It would take about 30 days, but they weren't going to make us wait the 30 days. I certainly appreciate you doing that. Um, my wife and I were relieved. You know, it would have been a long road. We fully expected that within a day or two, we would have received our building permit. That's not what happened. We waited two weeks and heard nothing about our building permit. Um, we reached out to our, uh, our builder, asked him to get a status from the code officer about where our, our, our building permit was. And the uh, response that was referred to us from him was, uh, this is from the code officer, I received I raised a concern about a transfer that does not appear to comply with a consent agreement. The town attorney has reached out to that party's attorney. I've not heard anything since last Monday. I'll let you know as soon as I know. I have a few issues with the way this played out. One, the agreement clearly states without any other conditions or requirements, when the agreement was executed, we were supposed to receive our building permit. That didn't happen. As far as the, tr the, the parcel that transferred and the concern he raised, the agreement also states further down in the agreement that that parcel can be transferred, can be conveyed and reconveyed as many times as they want, as long as they didn't try to get a building permit. So I think that would have covered the fact that the parcel went to the late Mr. Brackley's son rather than him. And that's, that's what happened. I, that was the issue, is that it went to his son instead of him. Um, and lastly, in the May 4th town council meeting, Mr. Joseph stated in the meeting that the transfer of that parcel wasn't even a concern for the town. So the grounds on which our building permit was delayed is invalid. There, there was no valid reason for him to delay us another two weeks. Now, two weeks doesn't seem like a lot, but after waiting for seven months, it's kind of like a twist of the knife. Um, so I'll, I guess I'll, I'll pause there in case there are any questions or comments. You keep going. Yeah. Um, the, the second thing I want to talk about is the subdivision itself, which is kind of two parts. I'll try to go through it quickly. Um, my wife and I went under contract in June of 2020. Uh, in July, our, our real estate agent had contacted us and informed us that there was an issue with Harmony Lane with the road. Um, she didn't have any details, but she recommended let's delay your closing, which originally I think it was like early August we were supposed to close. And she recommended we extend our contract. Don't buy a problem. Wait until that's resolved and then, you know, move forward with the closing, which we did. Uh, later in, I believe in the month of July, we had spoken with the planning department and our first question was, is, is there a subdivision issue here? Because if you drive down Harmony Lane, even to my, un I'm not a code officer, but to my untrained eyes, there's clearly four or five building envelopes. So there was, there was a, looked like there was a lot of parcels that were gonna be developed there. We were told no, there's no subdivision there. The issue had to do with the fill permit. It has to go before planning review board. You guys are fine, you'll be able to build. Fast forward to September when that board met, 
Um, it was also stated in that meeting, there's no subdivision, this is not a subdivision, it's a private road. The fill permit was ultimately issued. So up to that point, we had no concerns that we had any issues with building our home. So we closed in, uh, end of October. The very next day, I contacted planning and asked for a, um, if they had a copy of the plot plan for our parcel, um, which they sent us. Um, it was a version of the uh, drawing that came with the fill permit application, which showed parcel C as one large parcel. We had only purchased a portion of it, which is where the split occurred. I e emailed them back immediately and said, the information you have is outdated. We're only buying a portion of it. She said, well, that, that's all we have. So we found other ways to get what we needed. But again, no concern was raised. The summer comes along, we apply for our building permit. I think we all know what happened. All of a sudden, there's a subdivision issue. So throughout that four or five month period, we had been relying on information from the town. We specifically asked if there was a subdivision. The planning review board meeting uh, approved a fill permit, said it wasn't subdivision. And then so we, we delayed, continued forward, and finally closed on our property based on information from the town, which you then invalidated by saying there's a subdivision issue there. Extremely surprising and frustrating for us. The, the, the other piece I, I want to talk, and this was belabored, this is, this is what I think took the, you know, the length of time it did to resolve this, is the interpretation of the subdivision ordinance. When an ordinance contains exemptions, it should be construed liberally in favor of the landowner. That's not my opinion, it's the opinion of the state. So much so that it's in the training manual for code officers and it is supported by case law. In fact, two separate court cases. We had a number of real estate professionals, a national real estate agency, title companies, real estate attorneys, all looked at this situation and said there was no violation. But your code officer decided there was a violation and I'm struggling to understand how the town can support that position. Given the fact that you had a number of professionals licensed and certified with experience, with real estate, and the state's guidance to say liberally construe it in favor of the landowner, how you went forward with the way you did. Um, I think that was all I had. Again, I'm, I'm grateful for the work you did, but I'm, I'm left very frustrated and disheartened. Um, I struggle to understand how any, re I consider my, I think I'm a pretty reasonable person. How can any reasonable person make an informed decision when the town doesn't stand behind the information that they provide? Thank you. Can, can I ask, um, sure. after all the delays, which we can get into, once you got the initial building permit, how did everything go from then forward? Very well. Very well. There was, yeah, there, was, there were no issues once, once we actually started building, it went smoothly. No issues with the actual building and the, the yep. permit? Okay. Okay. Um, um, yeah, Council Fournier. Uh, are there any other property owners that have similar experience within this area that you're aware of? I can tell you that, you know, my grandfather had a saying that, you know, if you have a good experience, you'll talk to a friend. If you had a bad experience, you, you'll tell everyone. Throughout this process, I have talked to all kinds of people, and I can tell you that business owners, building suppliers, tradesmen, residents in Freeport, all were shaking their heads in agreement, like, yeah, we, you, we know. We've, we've heard, we've had similar experiences. We had building suppliers that they could guess where we were building without having to tell them. And I, I know early this year, the Sun Journal wrote an article about Freeport. Um, uh, Mr. Phillips, you were, you were quoted as saying you're trying to rectify the reputation that Freeport has. So it's, the, the reputation precedes us, unfortunately. It's not, it's not a good, uh, not, not good optics. Got it. So, again, to clarify, no, nothing is unresolved today that needs attention no, going forward. Yeah, this, this is more this just is behind, this is historical behind us at this point. for us yep. to kind of look into yep. and look back on and see if there's anything that we want to uncover or, or take action on, but which we'll do. We'll kind of have it probably not at, at tonight's meeting, but sure. we'll, we'll look into it. I'm sure we'll, we'll meet and talk about it individually and, and maybe as a group if we need to as well. Um, yeah. I'd like to do it as a group, maybe at a future council meeting executive session uh, uh, with, with the manager and the council. We can, we can we can look into that yep thanks for sharing your concerns i appreciate you coming forward and letting us thank you much if you have any unfolded. questions or want to want me involved in any kind of conversation uh, mr joseph i think you have our, yeah, our you know how to get a hold of information. information okay 
And you can feel free to email the council with your contact info in case sure. they want to reach I out. I can do that. Yeah, our emails are all on the website. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I can do that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks again. Anybody else from the public who wants to come up and chat, share ideas, opinions? Anybody on Zoom? I don't see any hands up. Nobody else? All right. Then I think we're ready to move on from public comment. Uh, next up is our seventh order of business, where all the action happens. Uh, and first up in that is our consent agenda. Uh, and we have five items on our consent agenda. And I believe that there is interest in removing one of those. Uh, so the uh, I'll list the five that we have and then if anybody wants to remove one, we can do that. So we're appointing a sealer of weights. We're accepting a donation to the library and another donation to Freeport Fire and Rescue. Uh, and then we have two liquor licenses to consider uh, both renewals, one for Mass Landing and one for Cadenza. So, Councillor Egan. Yeah, I'd like uh, just briefly to remove item number 172-22, the liquor license renewal for Mass Landing Brewing to um, just allow a representative to clarify um, some recent uh, actions that the applicant has taken um, on their permit request. Got it. So with that removed, we've got four items left on the consent agenda. Uh, the four I previously mentioned minus the mass landing brewing. So uh, I'll make a motion, be it ordered, that the September 6, 2022 consent agenda as amended be adopted. So it Do we need to accept adopting. the amendment first and then... Except what what will this do to Mass Landing Brewing? Is it uh, we're going to discuss them individually right after the consent agenda. So I'm just okay. proposing a reduced consent agenda, and we can <coughs> deal with that. And then right after that, we'll talk about the, the one we removed. You need a second. Second. Thank you, Councilor Lawrence. All in, any discussion on the consent agenda, the four remaining items on the consent agenda? All right. All in favor of adopting that four-item consent agenda? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Thank you. Uh, and now we can talk about item 172-22, which is a renewal for the liquor license for Mass Landing Brewing. Please approach the podium and introduce yourself. Good evening, uh, Chair Pilch, uh, members of the council. My name's Brandon Mazur. I'm an attorney at Perkins Thompson here on behalf of Mass Landing Brewing Company to clarify a couple things on Mass Landing's uh, liquor license renewal. Uh, as you are uh, probably are aware, uh, Mass Landing is located right next to uh, Nighthawk's Kitchen. Both entities applied for individual liquor licenses uh, at their respective times. At the time we had installed, uh, both parties had agreed to install a takeout window to allow people to get food only between Nighthawk's Kitchen and Mass Landing. Uh, when the state came in and uh, inspected for the liquor licensing portion, uh, they deemed that to be uh, an interest in each other's liquor licenses. Uh, so we've had to close that takeout window and I've been working with the state over the last six plus months or more to figure out how to get it open. You can have food go between, back behind, you can have it, you can go outside. So um, the way that we have, uh, short of amending the, the statute, which we may do into the, in the future, the way that the state has worked with us to get this taken care of is Mass Landing's license is up for renewal. They told us to apply for the renewal, but in essence, we are incorporating the entire premise as part of the liquor license. What we've done is created a new joint venture called Mass Hawk LLC to hold that license, which will be the name of the, the licensee at this point going forward. It'll be Mass Landing, the date of renewal for Mass Landing. Nighthawk will give up their license once this is approved. So in the eyes of the state, it'll be the entire premise that will allow the food to pass through. The actual agreement between the two parties is in essence, they will be operating independently, ordering their own, having their own supplies. It's just purely to allow that takeout to happen between Nighthawk and Mass Landing and make it a little bit easier for people to do, to do food between the two locations. Um, but happy to answer any questions, but it was a little bit of a nuance from a pure renewal that we wanted to clarify um, for you. Brandon, so the, the, the request here that you made to the state to have a joint 
licensee between the food operation and the beverage operation is really for the convenience of operation at the site and for the convenience of the patrons? Correct. And the, but the two businesses are staying independent of each other. It's just the license that's going to be held by this joint entity. This new LLC will hold the license. The individual LLCs, Mass Landing or Mass Landing Brewing Company, which isn't an LLC, but it's a company, and then Nighthawk Kitchen LLC will independently operate. The only thing is they jointly applied for this license under the renewal for Mass Landing. Right. Okay. And you said that Nighthawks would be giving up its liquor license once this is con uh, confirmed by the state? Uh, yes. And would that also be um, this license would be the replacement for what Mass Landing has in place as well? Correct. So it would be one license covering both areas. Both operations. Seems reasonable. Thank you very much for clarifying that. Absolutely. I have a question just to make sure that you don't get sent back again. I'm looking at the first floor layout and the item outlined in red as the consumption area. Looks like it doesn't include Nighthawk keep, Kitchen. Keep flipping. So the way the state let us, so you've got the first floor layout, the yeah. second floor layout, the yeah. outdoor patio layout, yeah. and then you have the Nighthawk space. Got it. So this all four layouts are now incorporated into oh, the got it. So license. The Nighthawk is incorporated as a separate unit into there. Okay. So as long as you you and the state are good with it, that's fine. Yeah. I talked to uh, Larry Samuel, who's the director of uh, liquor licensing for the state, and this is, he sort of handheld me through how to do this. Got it. And then another kind of formality on the front page, it says it's a renewal license? Is that so that's how he wanted, that's why I came in as a renewal here. It's a renewal in the eyes of the state because they know what we're trying to do. Okay. This is when Mass Landing is up sooner than I think Nighthawks isn't due until maybe February. Instead of doing completely new, he said, do it as a renewal. We know what you're doing. This is a, and then as long as the town's okay, we're good. So. Good with me. The state's okay with it. And they're okay with it. <clears throat> so, uh, Mr. Lawrence, Council Lawrence. Can I make the motion that we approve the license for Mass Landing Brewing and Nighthawks? Second. Any other discussion? It's pretty straightforward. All in favor of renewing the license? Aye. Uh, it's unanimous. All right. I'm going to send thank you for coming and explaining all that. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Get this stuff signed and in the appropriate place. <laughs> Does, does this mean that you'll be able to open the window and pass food back in? Yeah. Your signature Ask the oyster guys how that goes. They did the same thing yeah. when they opened up the oyster house. All right. I'm going to get back to signing then. <clears throat> I don't want to delay it anymore. It always seemed a little odd that you can get food around the back of the bar but not around the front of the bar. So hopefully we can fix that. We all sign? Uh, yeah, I'll pass those two down. And Matt, if you can send this down to Chris after you're done with it. Um, and Chris, just to confirm, the other liquor licenses here, I think, are for next time when we do the public hearing. Everything in that should be stuck. In this folder. In that folder. Okay. There's a liquor license for China Rose and Good yep. Fire. Yeah. We're getting there. Okay. Got it. I thought we were setting those public hearings, but we actually have those public hearings tonight. Uh, public hearings. Next. All right. I should read the agenda. Okay. So, look at this. Our next item up for discussion is item 156-22 to consider action relative to a new liquor license for China Rose. Uh, there's a public hearing on this. Councillor Pillsbury, would you like to open the public hearing? I make a motion to open the public hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Is there anybody here to speak from the public about a liquor license application for China Rose? Anybody on Zoom? Nope. I know there's a representative of the company here, but... Um I don't see anybody from the public looking to speak now. Okay. Uh, if there's nobody willing to speak, Councilor Pillsbury, would you I'll do the a, honors? Make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Public hearing is closed. Councilor Pillsbury, keep on going. Uh, be it ordered that a new liquor license application for China Rose located at 23 Main Street be approved. Be it further ordered that copies be distributed equally between the town clerk's office, town manager's office, and Freeport Community Library for inspection by citizens during normal business hours and notice be placed in the Freeport local cable channel 3 and the town's website. Second. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, any discussion on the China Rose liquor license? All right. All in favor of approving the China Aye. Rose Aye. Aye. license? Aye. I think that was unanimous as well. Well, this one needs it. Yeah. I'm just, yeah. 
Uh, check mark. Sorry. Oh, because this is setting a public hearing. Got it. Okay. Uh, so next up, well, are we having a public hearing or setting a public hearing? Yeah. Um, Good fire is setting a public hearing. Good fire. We didn't set it last time. So, Chris, to clarify, it has a motion to open and close the public hearing on 157.22. Does not need it, right? Is it, we, we said it last time, right? You said it last time. Just that bottom part. Okay. I'm just looking back at the August yeah, so agenda. This is the public hearing. It's just that that bottom paragraph is not there. If you would take it away. Okay. We probably didn't need it here hearing. either. Okay. Sign a rose, good fire. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. i just looking back at last month's agenda, but yep. Uh, okay, so item 157-22 <coughs> is to consider action relative to in public a new uh, to do, relative to a new liquor license application for Good Fire, uh, and tonight is a public hearing for that. So, Councillor Fournier, would you make a motion to <coughs> open the public hearing? Uh, <coughs> make a motion to open a uh, public hearing. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. All right. So now we have a public hearing. For a liquor license application for Good Fire Brewing. Is there anybody from the public in the room or on Zoom who wants to talk about the liquor license application for Good Fire Brewing? Double negative. Double negative. Councilor Fournier, would you like to close the public hearing? I'd like to make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Uh, so, Councilor Fournier, would you read the be it ordered but not the be it further ordered? Correct. Uh, be it ordered that a new liquor license application for Good Fire Brewing Company, LLC, 180 South Freeport Road be approved. Second. All right. Any further discussion among the council on the Good Fire Brewing liquor license? Seeing none, call for a vote. All in favor of the liquor license application? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, so I'll send these down for your signatures as well. Uh, and moving on, now we're setting a public hearing for a new liquor license for the bake shop, uh, which is going to go into the old Azure Cafe space. Uh, so, Councillor Lawrence, would you like to read that be it ordered? Uh, be it ordered that a public hearing be set for September 20th, 2022, at the town council meeting that starts at 6 p.m. to discuss a new liquor license application for the bake shop LLC located at 123 Main Street. Second. Um, um, is there more? No, there's it for their order. We order. We did, are we doing that? Or do you want me to read that? Uh, I think we are, right? In this one, yeah. In this one. one, okay. Be it further ordered that copies be distributed equally between the town clerk's office, the town manager's office, and the Freeport Community Library for inspection by citizens during normal business hours, and the notice be placed on Freeport's local cable channel three and the town's website. Thank you. Your second, second. still stands. All right. Thank you. Uh, any discussion on setting a public hearing? All in favor of setting the public hearing? Aye. That's unanimous. Thank you. That was item 158-22, which brings us to item 159-22 and Councillor Daniele. <clears throat> um, oh, yeah. This is a special amusement permit for the bake shop. Okay. Uh, which we're also setting a public hearing for. Be it ordered that a public hearing be set for September 20th, 2022 at the town council meeting that starts at 6 p.m. to discuss this new special amusement permit for the Bake Shop LLC located at 123 Main Street. Be it further ordered that copies be distributed equally between the town clerk's office, town manager's office, and the Freeport Community Library for inspection by citizens during normal business hours, and the notice be placed on Freeport's local cable channel 3 and the town's website. Second. Thank you. Um, so just to clarify, there we have two public hearings next time. One is for a new liquor license. The other is for a new special amusement permit, which allows them to have fun along with liquor. Uh, any discussion on setting the public hearing for these guys? All in favor, setting the public hearing for the special amusement Aye. permit. Aye. Aye. That's unanimous. Uh, moving on to item 160-22, we're setting another public hearing. Uh, this one has to do with parking. Oh, got it. I will sign and move it down. Uh, I can. Well, uh, <laughs> we'll find out. 
Uh, while I'm doing this, uh, Vice Chair Egan, would you read the uh, motion for item 160-22? Be it ordered that a public hearing be set for September 20, 2022 at the Town Council meeting that starts at 6 p.m. that evening to discuss amendments to the Freeport Zoning Ordinance, Section 104, Definitions, and Section 514, Off-Street Parking and Loading. Be it further ordered that copies be distributed equally between the town clerk's office, the town manager's office, and the Freeport Community Library for inspection by citizens during normal business hours, and the notice be placed on Freeport's local cable channel 3 and the town's website. Second. Thank you for reading that a little bit slowly so I can finish signing. Uh, these two are now ready to go down there. Uh, any discussion on this? So uh, before we vote on this, just a reminder. So this is about changing parking rules for downtown, which uh, is more than just a perfunctory kind of a thing. So the planning board discussed it, I think at least two of their meetings because they had to discuss it and do public hearing and all that. FEDC has talked about it. It's part of our downtown vision. So there's been a lot of discussion. I don't think there's a unanimous uh, consent on it, but there's a lot of support for it. So if you have questions you want to ask or anything you want to look into before the next meeting, um, do that. Uh, and then we'll talk about it uh, on the 20th and, and maybe adopt these new parking regulations. So with that, uh, any other discussion before we set the public hearing? So all in favor of setting the public hearing for the 20th? Aye. Uh, with Councillor Lawrence stepping out of the room, that's five to zero. So we have a public hearing for parking. And we are back at Council Pillsbury for item 161-22, which is setting a public hearing uh, for non-conforming buildings and changes to the zoning ordinance for that. Uh, be it ordered that a public hearing be set for September 20, 2022 at the Town Council meeting that starts at 6 p.m. to discuss amendments to the Freeport Zoning Ordinance, Section 202.C.1, Nonconforming Buildings, and Section 104, uh, Definitions Pertaining to the Expansion of Nonconforming Buildings slash Structures. Uh, be it further order the copies be distributed equally between the town clerk's office, the town manager's office, and the Freeport Community Library for inspection by citizens during normal business hours, and the notice be placed on Freeport's local cable channel 3 and the town's website. Second. Thank you, Councillor Daniele. Uh, any discussion on this one? I see Caroline's here if you have questions, otherwise we can talk about it next month, or next meeting, rather. Uh, seeing no questions, Caroline's off the hook. Any, uh, all in favor of setting the public hearing? Aye. 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 Uh, five to zero. Uh, and we're up to 162-22 and Councilor Fournier. Thank you. Uh, be it ordered that a public hearing be set for September 20th, 2022 at the Freeport Town Council meeting that starts at 6 p.m. to discuss the proposed ordinance chapter 64 Earth and Materials Processing Ordinance. Second. Oh, there's more. Yep. Be a further order that, that uh, copies be distributed equally to the town <laughs> clerk's <laughs> office, the town manager's office, the Freeport Community Library for inspection by the citizens during normal business hours, and that the notice be placed in Freeport's local channel three in the town's website. Second. Oh, done. Thank you, Councilor Lawrence. Uh, any discussion on that? This is. Uh, this was at the ordinance committee for a long time. It was about rock crushing on site. Um, we went through a bunch of changes, waiting for an attorney to process it, and it's finally all done and ready to come back to us. So uh, that's what this is about. We can get into details next month, but if you have questions, let me know or let Caroline know she's been involved in this. Or Cecilia. Just want to point out that the title also changed in between mm. uh, the first draft and the second draft. It's fine the way it was word, uh, read. I think everybody knows what it's referring to, but... The new title is now Incidental Processing of On-Site Earth Material. So that's what a lawyer gets you is an extra two words, <laughs> extra two words in the title of the, um, of the ordinance. But still chapter 64. Still, <laughs> still chapter 64, and it's about earth materials, so no, no problem. But All right. Any questions about setting the public hearing? All in favor of setting the public hearing for this ordinance? Aye. Aye. All right. We're back to six to zero on that one. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have item 163-22 about replacing
main entryway doors at the Freeport Community Library, and I think it's Councilor Lawrence on this one. Okay, <clears throat> be it ordered that a contract for 30,000 for the replacement of the main entryway doors at the Freeport Community Library be awarded to Portland Glass. Second. Want me to read the, me to read the note? Or? Uh, yeah, might as well, it's informative. Sorry. It's okay. Note, $30,000 was included in the fiscal year 23 capital budget for this project. The Building Works Department is requesting that the competitive bidding process be waived due to supply chain constraints and work availability. Second. Thank you, Councilor Fournier. Uh, and we have our Public Works Supervisor Gibson here to talk to us about this item. Uh, yes, the reason that I've asked for the waiver is, is, as you stated, the time frame, the guaranteeing of the price, which is current, um, and the being able to get it done this year. Most of all of them that we talked to would not hold their prices until the work was started, which would be next year. Uh, main, uh, Portland Glass was one of the only ones that would do that for us. So they're saying they give you a price now that'll be good when they do the project next year? No, the, the library will be done this year. Oh, it'll be done this year? Yes, if, oh, okay. if y'all approve this and I sign this contract tonight, they will get the work done this year. And the library is pretty bad. You can move the bottom of the door six inches either way. I think, I think one of the problems that we're seeing that are that are all pointed out is with bidding. <clears throat> very few people are actually giving us quotes that are going to hold to them. I mean, reasonably, because the business can't be expected to eat a ten or a twenty percent increase in the six month that happens, or they're going to be for very narrow time frames. We'll see in the next one as well um, that the fence work. The only company that's why he's recommending that company. The only company that would even give us a price. We can't do the work until next year. Everybody else said, yeah, we'll gladly do the work next year, but it'll be at whatever price it is next year. So either we bid it now and take this price or we just have to bid it again next year closer to the job. So. But that's for the defense. The library is going to be done this year. Correct. Yeah. But that's, it's just a common thing we're seeing with smaller right. jobs, not so much construction and, and earthwork and road work, but uh, contracting and things like that. Earl's starting to see that more and more. Right. It's getting the materials in and then them being able to hold the price until you know six months when they're able to do the project and both of these companies we've worked with them in the past and they give us great pricing so. anyone have questions Councilor Egan Earl are these the doors that are in the glass wall that's the main entry or is it in the side entry where you go into the community the two, the two main entries the big the big one up front and then there was another one on the right so the big entrance I think they're if I remember correctly 10 feet tall both of them. It doesn't include any of the side stuff. Okay. Councilor Fournier. I know we are in the, the middle of supply chain issue and everything, but um, I'm kind of uncomfortable not getting bids. And, you know, I, I did this for a good many years, um, and, and I know I know where we're at. I, and I don't know. Uh, I know when, when we do a formal bid, it's very formal. It takes time. Uh, have you and did you call around Earl to check with uh, companies? We did, and and some of them would refuse to even talk to us because they could not guarantee the price, which was the big thing, and when the work would be done. That was the big issue that we run into, Mr. Foyer, was them holding their price until the work was done. And as I've talked with several towns, price changes three months. They expect the town to step up and to be able to give you a firm price that this is what it's going to cost. This was the best way we could do it. So, so this bid is good for this year. Uh, uh, this is good till the end of this year. Or how long is this good for? No, they they will hold their prices uh, until the job. I'll take done. one of them, the library doors. Yeah, that what you see before you tonight is guaranteed. That's what the price will be, and it'll be done this year. I see. With mainline fence, which I'm a little ahead of myself because that's the next one. They would not be able to get to the work, but they would guarantee their price to next spring, so the price would not change. So, so is it fair to say you put out a request for bids and for the doors, this is the only company that would respond with a fixed bid? I'm not going to say we requested, we called to sure. inquire yeah. about pricing. Yeah. And this is when we started hearing, well, I'm not going to give you a price now because the work, we can't get to it till next springtime. And then when we started running into that issue, that become a common occurrence. Yep. So, yeah, you, so you don't have any other prices to compare Correct. it to. Yeah. Okay. okay. Anybody else have a question? Will they give you a binding price for, will any of them give a binding price for next year if we were to expect the work to be done? I don't think we should be waiting until next spring on the work, but 
if we were to say, can we do this work in the spring, did anybody indicate they would give us a binding price until next spring? Yeah, mainland fence. Uh, for, for, the, for the doors. For the doors, sorry. Well, no, on the doors, no. Because the problem with the doors uh, is, is if a lot of companies are having trouble getting aluminum right now. And with the aluminum on there, that's where the problem runs into. Uh, Portland Glass actually has the aluminum in stock. They just had to cut it and start getting everything ready. That's the 13 week when they're getting it. Okay. I think Portland Glass is a reputable company and, and that's not my, my opposition, uh, you know, requesting formal bids. Maybe, uh, and, and this is up to Peter and you can discuss, discuss it with the department head, but it'd be, be nice for me as a counselor to say they called uh, Joe Smith, door company, Portland Glass and one other. Well, Joe Smith couldn't do it, the other one. That way we have treated everyone fair as we have in our process for bidding for the town. And, and to me, we don't get stuck with an appearance of, oh, well, we're going to Portland Glass. That's sure. all. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Is it just coincidence that the price they're quoting is the exact same as the price we budgeted? $30,000? Portland Glass, is, uh, the Portland Glass bid is a little above. It's $3,000 more than what we bid, $3,050 more than what we bid. Or what we quoted, I'm sorry. Correct, thirty-three thousand fifty dollars, and what we budgeted was thirty. So we should probably so change, change that. that. Yeah, we're gonna have to make that up on our operating budget because we don't Correct. have that in capital. And, and me and uh, Jessica already dollars. talked about making the difference. Three thousand and fifty. Yeah. Oh, three thousand and fifty. Oh, okay. Thirty-three thousand fifty dollars is the is the Portland glasses. Quote, yeah, but we budgeted thirty thousand. You have thirty thousand dollars in capital for that. Correct. Okay. And, we're so and if you go with the option on the fence, yeah. there's going to be about the budget part's yeah. not a problem, but the award amount is should say thirty three oh five oh. Yeah, absolutely. Right. In the Continue motion. Need yeah. Do you want to, uh, uh, Councilor yeah. Lawrence? Do you want to yeah. amend that? <laughs> There's second, second do we don't have a second yet for the amendment. Second. Second, thank you, Councillor Daniele. Uh, so is there uh, any discussion on the amendment, just changing the price? So we're all okay with that. Can we vote on the amendment, changing the price from 30,000 to 33,050? All in favor of doing that? Aye. Okay, six to zero, thank you. Uh, any other questions on the main? Did contract? we consider other materials? If aluminum is the hard point, could we have wooden doors instead? I think if you went with wooden, it's going to be more expensive because they're mm. yeah. you're 10 feet tall and they're about 25 feet wide. Mm -hmm. So you've got to have something there to support all that glass. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, remember when you start reviewing architecture for public buildings, everything looks great at the beginning until yeah. you got to replace it. Yeah. Until 30 years, 25 years later, then that old aluminum is expensive. No other questions. Uh, I'll call for a vote to approve the contract for library doors. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I think. Okay. Uh, I think I got four. Councilor. Aye. Aye. I'll vote aye. Then. So all six ayes. Then. Yep. Any anybody opposed? Just to clarify. No. Nope. So we got six to zero on that. Yep. The point I just wanted to make is just to echo what Daryl said that. We should have had a note in this explaining why we're doing it this way. I mean, I would feel comfortable doing that. I mean, I get the situation, absolutely, but I do want us to reflect that it's outside of normal policy. Earl, in the future ones, can we include the, um, the companies that you contacted as well, what Council of Fournier recommended? Just if there are people who aren't able to quote, can we just have a list of the Absolutely. People who uh, didn't either decline to quote or said they couldn't or something like that. So we usually do that when we do bids. When you get one or two bids back, you say, hey, we 17 people knew it was out there but said, hey, we can't do it. So, right. So it would just be, yeah. Just more documented information, I think, would make people more comfortable. So, yep. It would be my hope that I don't come before you asking to waive the bidding process ever again. Um, <laughs> that's that's well. my hope. You usually don't. So. No. Oh. Except for this one coming up. <laughs> As Mr. Darrell knows, we, we have always bid out 
most everything. These are just two items with a circumstance of time that's difficult. All right, so don't go anywhere because item 164-22 is uh, a similar item for the library fence. So, Councillor Danielli, I think it's up to you, right? Should we ask him if that's the right number? Uh, yeah, okay, let's, let's just check open. the, uh, we have the contract here. 19,140 matches the that's estimate. The right yeah, yeah 19,140 is the, the quote for the fence. It actually will come under bid coming in under a little bit. Yep. Be it ordered that a contract for $19,140 for the installation of a white PVC Victorian picket fence at the Freeport Community Library be afforded to mainline fence. Note 20,000 was included in the FY23 capital budget for this project. The Public Works Department is requesting that a, the competitive bidding process be waived due to supply chain constraints and work availability. Second. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Uh, so similar situation here. Yes, sir. The, the only difference in this one is the work cannot be done until next spring. The price will be guaranteed, but the work will be done in the springtime. How many how many people or uh, companies did you talk to on this one? Probably, I know I think talked to three. I talked to a company in Augusta that wouldn't even wouldn't even commit to any kind of price. And I'm trying to remember the defense company in, uh, I'm trying to remember where they, they weren't from Augusta. Um, I don't remember, Mr. Peter, I'm gonna be honest with you. I didn't write it down. I know I talked to one in Augusta though. Okay. And I'll be glad to hold this and rebid it in the spring. That, that's, that's not a problem, that's your, that's your discretion. Does that give us issues with lead time for construction or when can we do that? Uh, if we if we bid it out, I can bid it out this winter and see what we get on pricing. And it, it would still be next spring before it, I'm hoping it could be done next spring. Well, it's not gonna get done until next spring anyways, right? Correct. Under this, under this one, it will not get done until next spring. So the, da the upside is that we may get competitive bids. Downside is we may not, and it may cost more. more. I don't have a magic ball, but if that makes the council more comfortable, it sounded like it would to me. I it may take longer, potentially. Uh, I mean, potentially we might get further down the waiting list, but it's a next mm -hmm. year project anyways. Mm -hmm. So if the council would want to do this one next year, I, I think we could take Earl's suggestion. and I would be perfectly one. fine with that. Yeah. I know that the neighbor's been very patient about getting this fence replaced. I think, and I think they know it's not happening for a while. Till yeah. next year, it is in pretty rough shape, but it's not gonna happen any quicker just because of availability scheduling. Well, I don't know if we know that. I think it, if we bid it this winter, there could be 17 other municipalities who are trying to get fencing done, and we could end up saying, uh, okay, we have a firm price, but it won't be done until September of 23. I, I mean, there's a downside, but we, we have a possibility of saving a very small amount on a very modest contract versus going forward with what we have in front of us. I'm I'm in favor of the latter. Mm -hmm. Well, the good for 30 days, right? From the uh, from the time it was quoted yesterday. So, I mean, there's still a few days to call and find out. Get some other quotes. Well, well when you talk to these people. The other two were not even interested. They, they couldn't give me, one of one of the things that, that I asked for was a price that would be good when the work was done and they, they could not do that because they had to order the material and they said, we don't know what it's gonna cost us and with the way everything's going, we're not gonna take that opportunity or take that chance That's to quote true. you something then it cost us more. Right. So that was the reason Mainline Fence would, would honor their quote right now. Yes, Mr. So I guess the question with the 30-day estimate, not to add to your workload, Earl, but I'm just wondering, uh, you know, is there a way to go out to see? We don't know, uh, you know, that, you know, you maybe could check in the next couple of weeks before our next council meeting and say, we know what this is good for. We got a 30-day <coughs> commitment. Well, <coughs> that wouldn't be good until the well this one expires. 10th of September. Okay. Yeah. Well, we got well, I, think, yeah. Yeah. I think it's safe to say Mainline will quote again a binding quote for next spring. That amount may just move around based on what prices have changed in the past month. Mm. I'm not so worried as I'm I'm pretty confident they'll give us 
like if we get to the 11th and we ask them or you know the 22nd or the 15th of next yeah. month they'll give us a quote that's good for next spring that's what they're doing as a policy it just may move around yeah, probably up a little bit but it could yeah. you know up or down um that's not a concern to me if we can i'm more concerned with going through the bidding process and only getting this back and yeah. being further down only getting one response and just yeah. being further out on it but i agree but i mean I, I so think two, so two things we don't have a crystal ball i can't predict it the second thing yes yeah, yeah. so these let's, these yeah. bidding amounts also the standards where we do quotes and bids i think we're put in place we looked at them in like 97 or 2001 or something like that so they're 22 years old the ten thousand dollar cutoff to get quotes versus competitive bidding i've already talked the past three weeks with our finance director about maybe changing that policy because we shouldn't be bringing ten thousand dollar bids in front of the council for award when prices have tripled since then right. um but that being said that's currently your policy <coughs> i'm not going to break it without you guys blessing it because i don't want to go to auditing jail <laughs> which is in a rail jail it's a slap on the wrist well, I, i'm in favor of going ahead with this we, this is not a huge i mean it's more for most people but and we don't have to do it again it's done yeah yeah i'm getting the sense that that's the general consensus so unless mr gibson brought it to us for this reason just get yep. done yep yep so unless there's any objection i'll call for a vote on item 164-22 for the contract for the library fence all in favor Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That's six to zero. So we can go ahead with the fence and the doors. Thank you, Mr. Gibson, for I like thank the council that work. Appreciate and, it. Yeah. Um, and then we've got another uh, contract to deal with. This one, I think, we're up to Councilor Egan for uh, item one sixty five dash twenty two uh, for uh, selling some fire equipment. Be resolved that the following three pieces of fire equipment be offered for sale by sealed bid, outdated mobile portable radios, tanker number two, and engine number one. And three pieces means three sets of equipment because the mobile radios are the ones that we replaced as we talked about with the council recently. So it's a whole set of interoperable radios. Second. Thank you, Councilor Lawrence. Uh, Chief Conley, my agenda says you have five minutes to... Tell us about this, if you like. <laughs> you can do it in one, I promise. Huh? You can do it in one, and we'll be thrilled. Like. Oh, okay. So, a couple things. Um, is first thing is the radios. The radios are the uh, equipment that come out of the apparatus that was um, that was replaced when we went to the new digital system, uh, and so forth. So they're just sitting on our shelves, collecting dust, uh, and basically there's. You know, we can put that out to bid um, and uh, collect some revenue on that and put that back into capital. Um, and there might be a department out there that would be better, would benefit from upgrading their radios to these radios that is not the same volume of, you know, as far as what we need. Uh, and tied into that's portables. So I got about a dozen mobile radios and, and about, you know, 30, 40 portable radios that will uh, be up for a sealed bid. I do have a interest party in town that could possibly utilize those radios. Just don't say who it is. But I'm not. Yeah. So they have to bid. They they would need to bid, but they you know might you know go to something that's local and uh, and so forth. So so that the next thing we have is Deputy Sylvain can answer any technical questions you got for it, but it's also is to take and put tank two out to bid. That's one, and engine one out to bid. Those two apparatus is being combined into the new engine that we expect, you know, later this fall delivery, the pumper tanker that's in the capital budget. One of the reasons why it's getting that out now is that uh, housing it, you know, we we'll want to kind of move it so it isn't sitting in the parking lot collecting rust and snow and everything. And there may be a community out there that would be benefit from those two pieces of apparatus so do we hope do we hold on to them until the new it's apparatus is here and all pretty well service? i mean it's been that's been our past practice yes yeah. yes that's our practice yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> 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 seems, seems like common sense without i'd ask yeah 
Because the one time we give a three-day window in between, there will be like a multi-structure fire, and then we go, hey, what, what happened to our tanker? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Councilor Fournier. The only one question I have is this will not affect the ISO rating, correct? We're replacing to a full on. I don't, I, I'd have to research that, Chief, as far as further to answer that wholeheartedly. Well, uh, that's a critical question. So my, my, in my, I haven't talked to McGool Drift, um, but in my um, digging through ISO. Can you give him the uh, mic, the handheld mic, just to yeah, 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 step, or, up. Or step up, yeah. Um, ISO, um, we do have, Yarmouth now has their tanker online, and that is automatic on any desk box. So anything out of town, we have an automatic four other tankers coming from four other departments. Um, so we meet the water requirement for out of hydrant for ISO. So, so I, I, sorry, go ahead. You asked the question. I just want to make up. sure we work very, very hard to get the lowest rating this town's ever oh, yeah. had. That this will not affect that. That's all I want. And if you can assure me that's the case, I'm 100% behind it. No, we, we uh, you know, I was talking with Chief because um, that question did come up. Um, and, and like I said, we, we benefit very much having our run cards up to date and having apparatus on our first initial alarm. Um, so if we go out to a possible house fire out of Hydrant District and we have those labeled, um, we automatically get four other tankers. So we have five tankers on that, that response. That gives us our ISO rating out of Hydrant. That's automatic. Um, if, they, if Brunswick's tied up, they get bumped, another town gets pulled in all by the CAD system. So if I don't get four out of town tankers, or initially, they'll start pulling from, we could get Lisbon, we could get, depending on what part of town, we, we will get four tankers. They're not gonna be yellow, they're gonna be different colors, so. So is the concern that reducing the number of apparatus would affect the rating, or just the tanker? We, we went through a very extensive, uh, about two or three years ago, eight yep. years ago now, I guess. I bet you longer than that, but, but still, yep. Longer than two. Excuse me. We were able to lower our ISO rating. We had a rural uh, ISO rating of, I believe, it was nine, and we lowered that to a six, if, or was it a five? Yeah, five. Or five. Yeah. Our our in in town structural, uh, we were able to lower that from a six to a four. So if there's a bump in either of those, uh, businesses and homeowners will see that on their fire protection uh, that they pay. So I, I just want to make sure we're not affecting that critical number that, that But the number of apparatus directly plays into that rating. Or it's, well, the, it's the number of, of the, the, yeah. no, it actually is the capability of the amount of water we can flow, and I think we've replaced the tanker with adequate pumping uh, and those items, and it, it also figures into your your hydrants, your staffing, your mutual, automatic mutual aid, as the deputy talked about. So it's a number of things, uh, but I think probably the answer at the end of the day is going to be yes. I just want to make sure it's yes. Yeah. Yep. So with the with the puffer tanker that's going to be here, our new our new build, um, that's going to have a compatible pump um, for a class A, and it's going to have the water we have. Um, Actually, it's going to have more water. We have 2250 on this truck. We're going to have 25 on the new. So you're increasing the gallons. Yeah, but we're also losing some water off the engine. So it's kind of one of those, you know, we're, we're right at that balance mark, but we still, we're, we're covered because of our, our run cards um, in response, depending on part of town. We'll, maybe we'll, before we do any sales on this, you and I and Paul will look at that, get that in at least as close as to confirmation of that in writing as we can, forward it out to the council so the yep. council's comfortable. Yeah, absolutely. We'll make sure you get a copy of that, Daryl. So when they change it on us after telling us it's mm -hmm. not going to be an issue, then it won't be these know. guys' fault, so mm -hmm. at least. Do, are we going to, we're putting this out to bid by this action. Are we going to see the actual sale before us, or we're just saying you guys can go, are okay to go ahead and sell it for yep. whatever you can get for it? Because right, right now the used, the used market is not very good. Uh, no, on apparatus. It's... <laughs> The thing with apparatus is it's a it's a special piece. Um, you know what we're what we're getting rid of, retiring um, our tanker. I mean that's a 1990 tanker. Um, it's 
you know, it's it's hauled a lot of water in its time. It's it's done its job. It, it, we really need to retire it. Um, the last tanker was picked up by Crookers. Um, they basically wet down their um, plant in Brunswick. They loved it. Um, I don't think it's in service anymore. Um, you know, engine one still has life in it. Um, that's a 2001. Um, you know, we just want to make sure we, we stay on our replacements for our apparatus. Mm -hmm. Now, a, you know, a smaller department, that, that truck is set up for, it's a rescue bumper, um, which all our trucks are. Um, so that's set up for multi-use. Um, you know, it, it's going to need some work. Um, whoever purchases it is going to have to realize it's, you know, it's a 2001. It's being run up in the northeast here. Um, it's going to need some work. Um, so, you know, but it is a particular piece for any department to grab. Um, my big concern, and I talked to Chief Conley, was where are we going to put this stuff? Um, I, can't, I can't have stuff sitting outside, and we can't have stuff sitting outside freezing. So it's, it, you know, we need to either find a house for it um, that's, that's climate controlled, or we need to have it professionally flushed yep. and winterized, like basically a big camper. Um, then the, can the question is, where do we put it so we're not interfering with plowing and snow removal and all that. So I brought this to the chief, um, and, you know, we, we talked about it, and, you know, he's bringing it to <coughs> you folks and see what we can do. So. And not saying we have anybody knocking down our door, but I think getting it out now and, you know, I think it's a, it might be a win-win for us, so. In spec, it's, it's let's put the delivery date in our bid spec, expected delivery date next sure. week, the next week after we receive, Correct. you're planning mm -hmm. to receive delivery on that, so. Correct, and yeah, that's no. one thing um, I, I intended to do last week, but uh, my p computer went, um, so. I didn't get a chance, but that's one thing <coughs> the chief and I talked about is, um, you know, delivery day of the new apparatus expected on, you know, but come look at it, uh, you know, so. And like, in, and the thing is, is with this, putting it out there so that other communities can look at it, and it's much like us going through processes and some of the discussions we've had here tonight over any of the bidding and so forth, those communities will be in the same boat. So at least it gives them a chance to get through the process and you know and basically say yeah we will accept that uh, you know you know two days before the arrival of your new engine and and we honor that contract so um, whereas we've had an ambulance sit out back um, for two years because we couldn't get rid of it um, so that's what we don't want so when, when do you expect the new apparatus to arrive so <clears throat> And Mr. Earl hit it on the head with you, you know, unfortunately, is we, I actually got a call from my sales salesman from Pierce. Um, it got pushed back first of the year they're expecting. Um, it's aluminum. <laughs> um, we, we go with aluminum just because of corrosion and stuff, and I got a f phone call saying uh, we got pushed back. So um, I, I, I'm expecting the first of the year. Now, I don't know if it's going to be January 1 or... Yep. You know, so unfortunately, it, it's. I think we're October, so at least two months now. We'll push back. Yeah. So, which puts puts a more of a wrinkle into trying to move the old apparatus out. Right. So it sounds like we're a little juggling because it'll be middle of winter, and we don't want to be without a piece of equipment. We can keep it heat, heated for 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 a couple of days, couple of days on the overlap. Yeah. Yep. Right. Got a public works crash. <laughs> Earl left. I'll incur, I'll, I'll incur the wrath of, of two plow drivers to keep that engine heated if you need to. I'll so. them up to 30 Main Street. <laughs> All right. It's not going to be my plow driver, though, because let me tell you, that end of the driveway gets a little rough when he's targeting me. So, Any, uh, any other questions about putting these out for bid? You guys comfortable voting on this tonight? Do we have a reserve at all on those? But no, it's just if I like put in a, terms of the price. Yeah, if I put a dollar, I'm the only bidder. Do I win? No, it's there's never been a never been a reserve on the apparatus. 
Yes. Yeah. I, unfortunately, they're not like the, you know, the smaller vehicles, the police cruisers and stuff like that, where they're more sought out. I mean, like I said, this is a specialty piece of apparatus. Um, now people have bought them and done some crazy stuff with apparatus, you know, in the recreational side and stuff like that. Um, I don't know. We, so. in bid specs, we always reserve the right to refuse bids. So if you put a dollar in. Yeah. But I mean, if you put eight thousand dollars in and we think it's worth ten, or you put fifteen in and we think it's worth twenty, we'll give it a hard look and talk with them and be like, "Hey, what's the?" I mean, you got to figure the length of time we hold on to it and maintain it and things like that. It's yeah. Yeah, there's, right. there's a cost to it. So, and, and you know, Council Fournier, I got to say the town's been very successful. We sold one many years ago. My favorite story is the Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. They actually bought <laughs> one of our fire trucks. Uh, old Engine Five went there. And the last one we sold to Winnipeg Pitlock, uh, they bought Old Engine 3. And here again, Winnipeg Pitlock has 20 calls a year, but that truck was a, a good service. So I think... It's still in uh, service. Yeah, and it's still in service still today, in service. and the Chief's very happy. So I think that we have uh, good spec equipment, so that's our plus side. I don't think... Yep. I know these guys, they'll do a good job uh, squeezing them. It's one of the can, other... So, yeah. It's one of the other things that's happening in the industry, plus, Jay, right together. is... You know, communities that have got trucks and, and they're basically frames of failing and stuff, and they're looking again, coming back to their ISO ratings and stuff. And the lead time to get a replacement in there is you're talking, you know, a year, year plus to get a truck. So a lot of communities are jumping to these opportunities as a stopgap. It will fill that need for that. So there's there is some dollar value in that or that arena. So. And you know, so there's been some local apparatus that have made it to some of the big cities just because they've faced those issues, and how how are they solving it? So, so I think the market's okay for us. Mm -hmm. Sounds promising. All right. So if you think you can beat Moose Jaw, <laughs> yeah, and it's an arm's length sealed bid, we can actually <laughs> sell it to people who are related if it's an arm's length sealed bid. Go for it. I'm gonna put the twenty thousand in. Be jump right up. All right, in order to facilitate Jake's new fire truck. Um, <laughs> all in favor of uh, item 165-22? Aye. That's everybody, six to zero, thank you. Uh, item one, and thank you, Chief and Deputy Chief, for doing all the, the work behind that. Thank you. Um, so our next item, 166-22, is uh, regarding a contract with GP Cog for a climate action plan. and. Councillor Pillsbury, would you do the honor on this one? Be it ordered that contract with GP Cog for the completion of a climate action plan be approved. Be it further ordered that the town's competitive purchasing policy be waived for this project. Note the council uh, appropriated a one time expense of $12,000 to fund the GP Cog climate action plan from ARPA fund funding for fiscal year 23. Second. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Uh, we've got our, I know I'm listed, but we've got our Zoom. Caroline. Yeah, we've got a Zoom crowd on here. Um, we've got our planner. We also have. Um, let me. Also, going to add GP Cog staff here in case we have any questions. Okay. I have not been involved in this project since the budget season, so I'm right, turn it over to Caroline. Caroline yeah. yeah. Caroline, you want to give us some background? Sure. So I think this was something that came up from um, public input and input from the Sustainability Committee during the budget process. We have been working with GP Cog on our enrollment in the Community Resilience Partnership, which is a program through the state, which we're going to apply for grant funding to help us work with the RMS to support a full-time sustainability coordinator that would share between the two towns. Um, GP Cog to help us with that process, help us get some baseline data together that we'd use for planning processes. And as we prepare for a climate action plan, um, a member from FSAB was going to be here tonight. I don't think they were able to attend. Um, they feel pretty strongly that they'd like to continue the town's work with GP Cog on climate action planning and that the timing is great to get a baseline plan and baseline data so that we can incorporate it into some of our larger planning effort, efforts, such as the upcoming comp plan in the implementation of the downtown vision. You had a proposal from GP COG in your packet. Um, I will note with this, although GP COG will be leading the way in this one year process, it will take some commitment from the town of Freeport 
this is something we see um, the new sustainability coordinator that we hope to get part-time through the grant funding to be putting some time into support. We expect it will be 10 to 15 hours a week of that person's time. Happy to answer any basic questions or you do have Sarah from GPCOG here as well. Do we, do we have a sustainability coordinator yet or is there anybody been applying for the job and if not, what happens? And the grant application, I believe, is in. Um, I'm not sure of the timing on that. If it's not, it will be in um, by whatever the deadline is. So we're expecting decision on that. Uh, I want to say October. Caroline. Speak up if I'm incorrect there, please do. Sorry, I, you guys all froze for a minute. Um, the application deadline for the grant that we're gonna apply for with Yarmouth is due September 20th. We're Our expecting understanding is decision that on when? October, um, end, of end October? of October, early November. Okay, and we talked with Yarmouth, we're working on job description right now. We've talked about the technical details, where they're gonna be housed, what their work split would look like if it's successful. We expect to put that out when we know, or at least when we have an indication from the state that the, it might be before the formal grant is awarded, but when there's an indication that funding will be available to the two towns. So we're expecting that position to be on, you know, a month from that time, from when we get the award. I think that that's built into the plan here, the time that we're gonna be putting in. If, it, if there's any overlap, I know that our assistant planner is currently working with the sustainability Report Sustainability Advisory Board on all those matters and she'll kind of roll out of that role, transfer out of that role, sorry, um, when the sustainability coordinator, the part, the halftime position is hired. So if there's any overlap there, she won't be able to put, you know, 20 hours a week into it now, but she'll be able to do some of the work. Caroline, that's my understanding. Is that correct with uh, you're in Scott, uh, the, the Yarmouth planner's uh, understanding as well of how the, this position will work in the interim. Yeah, that is our understanding. Um, if G, if this bid is awarded to GPCOG, we expect that they'll start some work in the coming weeks. Yarmouth is in a si similar situation to Freeport with regards to staffing and the phases they're at in the climate action planning process. So there'll be some efficiencies in both towns doing some of this at the same time. In the interim, we'll provide staff support through our assistant planner if we need help getting some data entry and some stuff behind the scenes, but we really don't foresee a delay in the process of getting started if and when the bid is awarded by the council. So, so we're not posting the job until October or so, or whenever we hear back from the state whether or not we're going to get the grant because we're waiting on the Yarmouth to decide if they're going to join in with us? Oh, no, they're, they're in. We're applying together. Um, but... The, at least the last conversation we had, I think our direction to the two planners who are working on that process is when we know, um, actually Freeport's gonna be the one doing the posting and the hiring and all that. Right. So Judy and I will be handling that. But when we know, we may get some indication that yeah, these are gonna be, you know, we haven't done the official award yet, but yours is being looked on. We just don't wanna start an interview process on a 50-50 or, you know, something like that and then have to turn people away at the end. So right. when we get the indication, we're gonna do the posting. That may be well in advance of the grant award or they may say, hey, we can't tell you anything until the date of the award. We'll do the posting and the, the two towns will jointly interview immediately afterwards. So if, if the award doesn't come through, we're still going ahead and hiring a sustainability coordinator, but we won't be sharing them with Yarmouth? That's correct. But this is not for the sustainability coordinator. Right. It's not, this is work that they'll be doing, part of their duties. Part of their duties, and if we don't have one, then it's going to be falling on the town. Correct. And why are we having here that the town's competitive purchasing policy be waived for this project? Because it's an amount over ten thousand dollars, and I've got to put that in there if we want to do it. So in, and I think that this is a case where this is the probably the best course of action if it's judged to be in the best interest of the town, using a government non-governmental regional organization to do it. They've done the first half, this is the second half. But because that amount's over there, and that's why I said this is actually what led to us talking about changing those bid limits, not just, not the stuff that Earl was, the stuff that Earl was ha talking about happened much later, 
this twelve thousand dollars worrying about bidding a twelve thousand dollar project that will probably take us five hundred dollars of staff time to bid doesn't make a lot of sense to me so Councilor Fournier uh, maybe you can elaborate Peter uh, so last year and uh, I think we approved ten thousand dollars for cog what has that given us or maybe cog can that's answer. that's this we back oh, no, back man. in it was six I thought it was six thousand dollars last year yes mm -hmm. And right. now it's twelve thousand dollars this year. This was the this amount was in this fiscal year budget we approved in July. The one two I think Chip, you're referring to two fiscal years ago, right? Two budget cycles ago. Was it two? Was it no? It was, last it was last year. No. fiscal it, year two? It was last year. Was, was that phase one that we did last yes. year? Phase two this year? Yes. So so not last June, but the June before. So twenty one, you voted on a smaller amount. Yeah. That was phase one. This is phase two. It wasn't phase one and phase two at the plant at the time. Phase two is now. Yeah. So what, what did we get out of phase, phase one? one? Thank you. <laughs> Good question. Caroline and I know Sarah from GPCOG who has been doing the work with our people are both here. Do you, either of you want to take a swing at um, phase one to date? Or actually, which would have ended July 1, correct? Yes. Yeah, so sure, I'll give you the snapshot version. And then if you want more technical details, um, you can get the details from Sarah. So GPCOG has done some baseline data for us. You saw some of those maps and handouts that were presented at the Community Climate Action Planning Workshop we had this spring. They've also given us some guidance for considerations into our planning process. And then they've kind of given us a high level overview of the steps and process and timeline for the community action planning process. And if you want Sarah's here, she can go into more details about some of that data it was a, a couple packets ago you had a lot of that in your handouts so what's okay. different about this plan or what we're getting for 12 grand so uh, this is sarah hi everybody um so phase one was really sort of the the um initial planning and engagement phase where we engage with the committee, with the staff to um, look at existing planning processes and making sure that they sort of incorporate and consider um, climate change considerations into those. And then this is really the work of starting the climate action plan. So setting an emissions inventory baseline, looking at a vulnerability assessment. Um, so we're, you know, significantly further along than if you've been starting it, um, you know, sort of without the phase one that we did last year. Um, and we are so this is really launching the kind of climate action planning work um of putting together the full report and doing public engagement um, these were it's a i kind of laid out in the um in the proposal the data collection and analysis um action planning and then the report drafting and finalizing I have a, a question for COG. So we invested whatever amount we did last year. Is there going to be another proposal next year to keep this forward, or are we going to have a working document if we approve this tonight at a, at a specific time in the future? Yeah, so it's about a 12-month process, and at the end, um, you would have uh, a climate action plan, you know, with, a, with an implementation plan for going forward. and. Um, I wouldn't foresee another proposal unless there was, you know, specific actions you needed uh, support with or something like that. But at the end of this uh, particular proposal, you'd have the full climate action plan. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So could I clarify that? Because I'm looking at the memo, which looks like it came from GP Cog, describing the scope of work. And at the top, it says Freeport Climate Action Planning Phase Two Scope of Work Proposal. Targeted end date fall of 2023, but it has three phases. One, phase one is already complete, like we just talked about, but it looks like there's phase two and phase three that still need to be done. But the scope of work just says phase two. Oh yeah, sorry about that. That's a little bit confusing. I was thinking of this as <laughs> this is the second phase, and sort of within that, there's a couple phases of the climate action planning. But um, the the full proposal, the proposal includes the full scope, so it's just a. Got it. 
So the parts that are labeled phase two and phase three in memo on page one and two that you attached are both included with this work, correct, Sarah? Correct, exactly. So that includes data collection and analysis as well as action planning. Yes. Yes, exactly. It includes the full thing. So, so uh, after this is all done, we'll have the three outcomes are a greenhouse gas inventory report, an emission reduction target, the vulnerability assessment report, as well as a list of climate actions with basic descriptions. Yeah, exactly. And all those pieces sort of make up a full climate action plan. And I would just, Caroline, if you can weigh in here too. My understanding, I have not heard, have been marginally involved with the Sustainability Committee through their planning on this. Caroline's been less marginally, more more involved, less marginally, uh, and I know Cecilia's been fully involved, her assistant. I've not heard any discussion about further planning funding. I think to get at the question that was asked, um, plans for ongoing fiscal years. I'm not aware of that. Are you aware of any of that, Caroline, so we can give an accurate answer to the council? I, I am not been made aware of that. Um, my understanding is that the completion of this process will have some good baseline data, set some goals. Um, you know, the interesting thing about this project is we have been working with Paul Conley. He's been working on the emergency management. I think there's some good overlap and some information that the two documents could share. Um, I also think this information kind of like the vision this will feed into some data into our new comprehensive plan and we can adopt that as we go into that process um, but no i'm not aware that there's talk about a phase three i think phase three from the committee's perspective once you know they're staffed and they have their person will be more implementation of some of the goals that we set as a community all right, then I can commit. I won't have it in any budget proposals. That doesn't mean somebody won't come and ask you for future work to be done, but I'm not hearing anything that there'll be anything coming in front of you guys year three here. Councilor Daniele. As the liaison in the meetings I've been at, they, you know, what's saying, what, what is being said is accurate, that there is not an expectation of there will be more work with GP Cog. I'm not saying they're not going to come with additional proposals for new things, but that's different. Mm -hmm. Councilor Egan. Um, I'd just like to highlight, and I'm, I apologize that it's, um, I, I didn't get a chance to see this um, much before this evening to be able to provide some feedback, but I, I'm, I'm in favor of, of um, the engagement here and was, was um, involved with the initial process to start with. But I think I, I really want to highlight um, the vulnerability assessment and uh, at the end of what is called phase three in the memo here, the community engagement and priority setting. I think uh, particularly the community engagement and priority setting is probably the most important public work that as a council we can do um, because I think that the, the numbers can be, um, you can sort of see the numbers and if you're not fluent in what the units are and how they compare and greenhouse gas emissions in tons of, uh, you know, an invisible gas can be hard to comprehend. But I think that the purpose of getting this work done is to really have um, uh, products and discussions out there with the general public. And so I'm really hoping that um, the community engagement and priority setting is, is a highlight and gets picked up and once we have assuming we can get to a sustainability coordinator, um, that person will be uh, a champion for those kinds of events. When I have conversations with people in the public, there are a million questions about what does it mean and how does it affect Freeport and how does uh, you know, my personal uh, carbon emissions have any effect at all on the globe? And the answer individually is not very much at all, but collectively, we're supposed to be trying to aim towards something, and that's what the sort of the big black hole is. People don't know what we're trying to aim for. So I think having a community engagement and conversation so that we can get a lot of education material out there is crucial to having any sort of um, public participation in, in a buy-in eventually if we end up having to spend money on something, and the, and the vulnerability assessment is a good way to, to start on what those high-risk checklist items might be, starting with uh, Chief Conley's um, list of, of emergency management activities. So um, I, I don't disagree that having a um, community-wide emissions 
target reduction goal is worthwhile. I think that's a that's can be a part of it, but I, I really don't want that to be the highlight, I guess, individually, um, of why we're doing this. Um, it is, uh, you know, we're using uh, free federal money that came to us to pay for it. So I feel like, you know, that is a reasonable expectation for us to have on the on the ARPA funding for the contract, and I'm in favor of it. But I, I, I really want something that is useful for the whole community, not uh, a set of numbers and, and conclusions that, um, that the very few people can actually digest and understand. So I'm really hoping that we get the, the public process going. Good. Councilor Fournier. And maybe this goes back to Sarah Cog. Uh, when we initially uh, presented the money, what I was sold on, that we were working with other communities. So as I read this, we are now going on our own. Um, no, definitely not. I mean, in the sense that you will end up with your own climate action plan, but it's really good timing because both um, Yarmouth and Brunswick hopefully will be engaging with uh, GP COG this fall to kick off climate action plans, and we're completing one right now in Falmouth. So really regionally, there's been a lot of movement you know, from other communities and neighbors of yours to um, begin and complete this process of climate action planning. So you're definitely not going it alone. I think um, just for the purposes of this proposal and for a sort of clean way to engage with the COG, um, we're doing it for town, but it's really a collective effort and there will be a significant amount of kind of regional sharing that happens. And especially as you're sharing, hopefully sharing a sustainability coordinator with Yarmouth as they're going through the same process this fall as well. So when you're researching greenhouse gas emissions for individual cars that might apply to Brunswick and as well as Yarmouth and Freeport we just have a different number of cars than the other towns do something like yeah, that there, yeah there's a lot of efficiencies really actually in doing this um, in kind of in a regional approach because a lot of the data um, yeah. you know is, is not necessarily at the very specific town level okay and the, the total project for us would be 15,500 but it looks like GP COG is footing the bill for 3,500 of that through an MDOT grant, and we're being asked to fund the remaining 12,000. Is that accurate? Yeah, correct. We'll, we'll bring some other matching funds to it. Um, you know, 12 months of an engagement is a pretty uh, hefty lift, so we we are, you know, have found some other funding to help bring to it. And part of a small part of the funding for this, for, of the 12,000, will go to a Resilience Corps fellow as well. Um, right. from AmeriCorps that will be helping to support the project. Okay. Got it. How do you guys feel? Any other questions? Looks like we're ready to go ahead uh, with a vote on item 166-22 for a new climate action plan. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So that's four to two with Councilors Lawrence and Fournier. Uh, nays. Mm -hmm. Discussion from the public? Not on this one. We did have a bunch of discussion at the at budget time about the expense, which we had previously approved. So this is just and the contract. More than the expense. No, it's the exact same amount. We approved 12. You're welcome to step up and, and yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm happy to, to, to take public comment. Um, so we to, to set while you're working your way up, we, we approved twelve thousand dollars in the budget and we're spending twelve thousand dollars on the on the plan. My recommendation to this council is to reject Christine Eager's uh, CPCOG proposal that was included in here for multiple reasons. One is that um, it says using uh, Freeport service fees. I thought service fees were something from the, to pay for the activities that people, the town provided to people and now we're taking money from those activities and putting it as the spending component. The hook on this, this proposal was last time for phase one, they said, oh yeah, we've got $50,000 to spend and um, it just, come on in, we'll start talking and we'll get the 50,000 because of it. So now that 50,000 has disappeared and it looks like we have 3,500 from that 50,000. So you might, have, you might have put money in the budget for something, and I think what you're buying is 
I participated in the first meeting, and there was no, it's a consulting meeting, right? There's no answers. It's just, oh, yeah, 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 we'll do that, we'll do that. And, and I given, I've taken the uh, COGP information from their website in Portland, and let me give you what they'll give you. Um, exposure to hazardous waste. Yeah, it could increase. Public health challenges. Oh, increasingly face um, as our climate changes. Strain on social services. Yeah, yeah, it will increase. Um, food systems, potentially increase. Yeah, okay. Um, general social inquiry. Oh, we'll experience disproportionate items. Building and property damage. Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll get damage. Um, more power outage. Likelihood of power outages. And when I had the conversation, um, so um, let's see, sea level rise. Oh, yeah, we're expected to have sea level rise. So part of the conversation was, well, so what's the probability and what's the impact of each one of these? Is this group going to determine that? Oh, no, 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 we're not going to determine that. So what are you buying? That's what I want to know. What are you buying? And in effect, what am I buying? Because you guys are my agents. So that's what I'd like to know. I'm Deb Milite, um, District 3 report. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Anzuini, I want to just affirm what he is saying. I'd also like to say, when you say there's free federal money, uh, my dander gets up because there's no free anything. And uh, by the way, we're $30 trillion about to go to $40 trillion because of recent federal legislation. So don't talk to me about free anything, please. And when I see uh, everybody with their own clothesline for all their clothes, hanging them up, when I see people walking, when I see people stop taking, especially private jets, but also other jets, there's lots of things we free people can do because this is Maine. And so if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, use it up, wear it up, make it out and do without. Make it work or do without. We know how to be conservative and careful around here. We don't need some experts from COG or Portland or wherever they are, so please, Rescind that. Listen to Peter Anzalini. He knows what he's talking about. Thank you. Anique Milite of South Freeport, Maine, it's echoing the comments by Mr. Anzalini and my mother. Uh, already seeing some of the deleterious impacts of some of these reductions and goals being met. Uh, the, the California banning electric, banning electric cars in so many years, and yet already having to shut down the grid and having only four seconds of you know, electricity being generated by re renewable sources as opposed to not, and being forced into some of these renewable sources, and yet those need traditional sources of energy for their construction and delivery, and are not yet market ready in the slightest. Already problems in shortages, other countries where they've been banning, not, uh, cracking down on nitrogen and fertilizers, deleterious impacts on agriculture <laughs> in the Netherlands, Sri Lanka, the government just crashed in Sri Lanka. So this is just another step at the local level to some of you know, the ruination of the regular people while you know, those proposing it will not be suffering in the slightest. They'll, ha they'll have their perks and many regular people will be struggling to get by. It's trying to force us into electric car batteries which have a significantly reduced charge in cold weather which Maine is no stranger to. I want, you know, we want to be serious and careful about all the impacts being considered in these proposals. One gradual step of many. It will all build up and people may wonder why didn't, people didn't stop and think about it before. Thank you for your time. So thanks. Thank you all for, for coming to speak. I appreciate the fact that you took time. I'm glad we got to hear from you. Uh, and I'd encourage you to participate in the process as it goes along. There's a lot of community engagement plans. So you know, hold their feet to the fire in terms of making sure we get we're getting what we're, we're paying for, which I, I think will be a, meant to be an actionable plan anyway. Um, to clarify the, the budget a little bit, we still do have a $50,000 grant that we uh, are applying for, and we still may get that money in addition to the 12000 that we're uh, directing from ARPA funding to this project. So that's still out there. Also, just to clarify, I think there's some confusion on the 
the wording, which is GP Cog's wording, not ours, Freeport service fee, it's just budget tax dollars. Like there's no, I don't want there to be any assumption that that's coming from any other source. They they described it as a service fee, I think because in, in Sarah, you're online, you can correct me if, if this is wrong, but I think it's a service to Freeport as a member community that they're billing us beyond what we usually get from GP Cog. So I think that's why that wording came up. But for our purposes, there's no intention that that come from any other sources other than the budget of dollars the council's appropriated. So I know that doesn't. The extra fees that you charge everybody in Freeport? Right. That's not going to make you happy. I mean, that probably makes it worse for your perspective. But I just want to be clear it's not a fee that anyone's paying. That's coming out of our tax dollars. It's coming out of ARPA funding, right? For the because yeah. particular project, yeah. Okay, yeah. well then, so let, me, not, let me rephrase that. It's not tax dollars; it's ARPA funding, which is offsetting tax dollars, right. which I think is also another point that it is federal money that could be used for some other purpose that was raised. So, right. all different pockets, all the same tax dollars coming out of different Either pockets. Way we're spending the money, yep. Regardless of what yeah, your position. It's not really tax dollars; it's loans that we've been realizing. Regardless yeah. of what anyone's position politically is on the issue, I think it's very important that we. I'll look at the facts of where the money's coming from unbiased and fairly, which is it's federal money that we're all going to owe or our kids are all going to owe. Right. 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 So, but regardless of where you stand on the issue, I'm just trying to be clear on where the dollars are coming from. So. And just one last point. I would like for you to hold. You step up. I would like for you as the town council, since you've made this decision, I want you to be accountable for understanding the probability of every item that they identify in phase two and the financial impact of the risk that they identify. And there's, a, there's several, several documents that you can use that actually manage risk. And I don't think that this town or these, this committee understands any of it. Thank you. Again, thanks for coming and sharing the comments. It gives us a lot to think about. Um, I know I expect to be involved. I imagine a lot of us are probably going to be involved in the process and hopefully contribute and learn along the way. Uh, so uh, on to item 167-22, which I'm guessing might receive less interest from the public. It's about an automobile graveyard and junkyard renewal. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, Councilor Fournier, why don't you read this and we'll see what happens. Uh, be it ordered that the following automobile graveyard and junkyard renewal be approved for DAB. Second. Thank you, Councilor Lawrence. Any discussion on this renewal? I think maybe just where is it? Straightforward. Uh, yeah. just looking it up maybe now, somebody yeah. just give us uh, the uh, Allen highlights. Range I can look road. again, yeah. but. Allen Range Road. Yeah, there's there's two operations in Allen Range Road. Uh, DAB Inc., which is Dave Bolduck's operation, was timely. There's another one that renews every year that is still, you're still waiting on information on that, Chris, or are they not going to renew this year? Why don't you step up? Yeah. Freeport Auto Parts is the other um, business owned by Kathy Anderson, and she did not submit a renewal application. Okay. They have traditionally operated for many years, but they're tapered off right now. So they've been renewing without really doing any operations at that location. But um, DAB Inc. is, as you can see from the list of on-site and parts, that they're active. Four pages worth of cars and VIN numbers that they have on, on site. Yep. They do a good job of cataloging and also getting inspected on a regular basis, things like that. So we have not had any issues. In there was an issue the first year I worked here, so nine years ago, I think there was an issue about a state inspection. Um, they've been current on inspections, both from the town and the state since then, um, just as far as I'm aware. Any discussion, questions? All right, all in favor of renewing the automobile graveyard and junkyard permit? Aye. I think that's everybody. All right, item 168-22 is the last item on our action agenda, which is for an election warrant for November 8th. Uh, so, Councillor Lawrence, would you read this? Sure. To, uh, 
Be in order that the election warrant calling for the November 8, 2022 annual election be signed. Second. Thank you, Councillor Daniele. Any questions on this one? Uh, we've got a piece of paper I'll sign and send down to you if we pass this. Uh, all in favor of signing the election warrant? Aye. Aye. That's everybody, six to zero. So I'll get this signed and send it down. Um, we have two items in other business. Um, before we dive in, just sort of consensus from you guys. We talked about raising the limit for bidding from $10,000. Do you all want me and John to talk to Peter and Jessica and come up with an appropriate limit to recommend back to you? Yeah. Okay. So. We oh can, yeah. We can do that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We'll come back. Um, so first item, uh, other business is affordable housing, which I think we're going to dive into next time. But did you want to talk about that now? Yeah, certainly not going to take 20 minutes. Um, I just want to <coughs> highlight a little bit of what we're likely to see at a more a more, inf more formal, informal workshop um, on the 20th. Um, and part of this is coming from um, inquiries and emails and questions, phone calls, messages from the public who are watching for the first time in quite a long time uh, multifamily housing being developed in Freeport. We have a, the project that's coming to first phase conclusion out on the end of Desert Road or the, the beginning of Desert Road, depending on which end you live on. Um, uh, cross street um, and as we heard earlier there was a from Mary Davis there was another project on, on Depot Street that was approved and another one pending uh, right here on Main so uh, those are the first significant multifamily developments in Freeport in quite a few years uh, from the private sector Freeport Housing Trust itself hasn't even actually built one since Oakleaf 2 which I think was 2012 so that's at least 10 years um, and our population has grown, but more importantly, the demand for uh, more units with smaller households. That's a demographic that's happening in many places around the state um, has put an enormous demand on, on availability, let alone what it's doing to prices. So I think it's, um, it, it certainly is good timing for us as a council to be hearing and learning more about the issues going on, not just with uh, rent restricted or targeted affordable housing where there's a threshold like Freeport Housing uh, runs where many of the residents have to meet income criteria um, but workforce housing generally available rents that uh, the workers in this community can uh, move into in order to work closer to where they're live closer to where they're working um, and uh, we have uh, employment changes going on uh, we have our major employer building a uh, enormous new office complex just down the street here we have a change in other businesses going on so I think it's a good time for the council to hear from some different uh, folks in the community who are engaged directly with housing issues with uh, availability of rental but also from the for sale market you heard Mary mention earlier that anecdotally 75 percent of the homes sold in the last couple of years have been over five hundred thousand um, dollars that's astounding. Um, that's a significant increase, and it makes it impossible for uh, my three adult kids to move back to this community because they can't afford a five hundred thousand dollar house. And I'm not sure that uh, a lot of our <laughs> a lot of our town employees could afford a five hundred thousand dollar house if they had to buy one tomorrow. So I think our our uh, our <coughs> our involvement with this issue is is timely. So I'm hoping to get some. Um, some good discussion and dialogue. We'll have a couple of informal folks th available at that meeting on, on the workshop to present a small amount of data. This isn't gonna be an hour and a half slideshow with charts and tables, et cetera. There'll be some conversations about some uh, vocabulary, something called a housing affordability index, which is actually uh, calculated on a regular basis by the state. It's a lagging indicator, so it's looking backwards at the previous year. Um, but we can also get some insight from uh, real estate professionals about where uh, trends and rents and prices are going looking forward. Um, interest rates are a huge influence on that. Um, <clears throat> so we, there's a lot of different dynamics going on with the housing sector uh, in the state and certainly in, in, our, in our community. So the workshop plan for the 20th is really meant to be um, informational and educational for us to learn more there is not going to be um, a specific 
tangible recommendation for us to take action on on that evening. This is really just to open the conversation. You will likely hear from a number of different constituents who show up, including some members from the Social Racial Equity Committee, who are going to suggest some, um, some strategies that the Council can start taking a look at to address housing, housing affordability, and the lack of housing availability in our community. Um, so we have a couple of different ways to get to that. You'll hear about those on the 20th. Um, again, we're not taking any action. We're really just here to, to, to kind of learn some different modalities. Um, earlier this year, we heard a presentation from Brett Richardson and FEDC about how TIFs work. That's one of the tools that might come up as a possibility. Um, uh, and and it's, it, it's a good one because it's an opportunity for a community to share in making something happen intentionally rather than waiting for something to happen accidentally. Um, so that's really just the headline that I wanted to provide this evening. Um, I, I do this work in my day job, uh, so I'm, I'm familiar with it. I, I sit on a couple of different committees. Um, interestingly enough, I got selected to sit on a, a statewide committee that's looking at the impact of short-term rentals and affordable housing. And we know a lot about that because we touched that hot wire <laughs> uh, here in this community last year. Um, so we know what kind of a high voltage issue that is. Um, and I'm hoping to bring that experience to uh, the statewide board that I'm going to be on for. It's a short time thing. It's about six or eight weeks uh, later this fall. Uh, but I'll also bring back information that I hear about from what other communities are looking at around that particular issue. Um, I think it turns out that short-term rentals are um, a, an influence in the housing sector in our community, but I don't think they're anywhere near the top priority no. that, uh, you know, that, that would cause us to do something different than the tactic that we already have in place, which is a simple registry. Well, the good, um, the good news is for affordable housing, at least, that short-term rentals are clustered on waterfront properties. Waterfront properties are doing the bulk of the value uh, Increase. Mm -hmm. Increase mm -hmm. in Freeport right now. Right. Um, so, I mean, I think it's affecting things, but it's probably not affecting right. the low-end, medium-end departments that people are looking for. I think that high-end condos are definitely um, yeah. was something that they're seeing. It, it was already, also so. really encouraging to hear from Caroline, our planner, earlier this year. We had the, the Speaker of the House come and talk about a bill that was proposed and then eventually mm -hmm. passed to add accessory dwelling units uh, to allow for more or easier adoption of that and that our housing I mean our zoning ordinance actually already allows it so but we need to get that out there and we could we could be talking about that so anyway those are the kind of things that are going to come up on the 20th and that's that here what time um, it's it's it'll be at this segment of the agenda it'll be another business item oh. on the meeting on the 20th <coughs> One thing we had to workshop with Freeport Housing, and, and the discussion that was brought up was repurposing existing land they had to possibly take single family, or, or in the case on uh, down at uh, Spring Street, you know, they could possibly repurpose that, tear those down, maybe put multiple stories in. They they had not thought of that, have they? And I'm hoping we can refresh their memories on that because I think that's maybe a viable timing issue that we ought to maybe encourage them to look at to help with this important subject. Yeah, the, the lenders on those buildings will probably have something to say about them being torn down, <laughs> but um, that's certainly a good topic to, to bring up. Um, They'll I, be here. I, I was on that board years ago, and I know that there's a lot of restrictions in there, but certainly in the context of we want to add more units, that's a good place to look at. Um, yeah, Matt Peters, the um, director of Freeport Housing Trust, was on vacation last week, so I couldn't get confirmation, but He's been he's been contacted and is hopefully going to be able to make it for at least a portion of the session on the twentieth. A uh, couple questions. One, you just touched on it. Uh, who else is who? Are, who are we going to be hearing from? Because I, I think it's important to cast the net wide. I mean, I think this is going to be a really challenging issue uh, that our town faces. So, just wondering if you had like a, a list of people that are going to come to, to speak. Um, I, I don't have a list because I didn't want it to be John Egan's agenda item. <laughs> I really wanted to, to just sort of introduce the topic and and because um, there's a lot of vocabulary that, you know, a, a lot of us may not have been exposed to or understand and 
you can get way down into those acronyms and statistics pretty easily. So at a minimum, Matt, um, I asked, and you heard from, from Mary earlier this evening, I asked for um, Mary and or Tawny to just think about the topic and get uh, some solicited inputs from business owners about the challenges that they're having about hiring people and how the lack of rental housing is, is a factor in that. Um, the uh, Social Racial Equity Committee on its own wanted to push this as a topic for conversation and so they're gonna have a couple of different perspectives. I think Matt from the Freeport Housing Trust, um, he also has a uh, very well-known local realtor, Amy Cartmel, on his board, mm -hmm. um, who I think would also give us a good perspective on what's happening with the private, private sale market. So those were the folks that I had initially spoken to. Great. And uh, the next question is just kind of more as I think through the problem and, and how we're going to move forward, but also just to open it up to see what people are thinking. You know, how do we balance? I think we're going to get some good data from this, and I appreciate everyone's effort and, and Mary digging into this and, and coming back with some real uh, data on our housing stock. But how do we balance? We've got a couple of developments in the pipeline that you mentioned. You know, how do we not get too far ahead of ourselves before we kind of figure out what the future of housing in this town looks like? Because I think there's, I think it's an incredibly complex issue, and I don't want to stop things from moving, but at the same time, I also don't want us to get to a point where it's impossible for us to really address some of the challenges that we have. Um, so I just pose that as how are we going to be thinking about, because I think we have a chance to get this right but we also have a chance to kind of let it get out ahead of us. Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, I, I think the difference, um, again, going back to the timing, is we have, in, in the last just, you know, 36 months, we have how many units, if you add up Cross Tree and the one on Depot and the one proposed over here, I mean, that's, that's like more than 15 years' worth of yeah. building activity in three projects. So things have changed. One of the things that have changed is that the, the rents that are available that you can achieve as a developer are much higher than they've ever been. So that makes the numbers work on the project. But of course, those can come back down as well. Um, I think the trying to get on top of the issue is we can come up with ideas on how to stimulate and, and promote uh, a more uh, diverse array of economic um, focused housing so that there are targeted units, there's workforce units, there's, you know, it's more, uh, you know, the, the high end luxury market kind of takes care of itself. Those, those dynamics are always going to be at work. Um, but I think that the careful balance is we want to be able to continue to entice developers looking at our community, which we haven't had until quite recently. And so I think there's, a, there's some levers there that you want to put something in place to encourage it. But if, if that goes too far, and so as an example, I'll just say if we were to propose inclusionary zoning, which I want to make sure I'm on record, I'm not proposing inclusionary zoning, um, that, can be, um, that can be a very powerful tool to get the community, the development community, to do X and Y and Z. But in, in our region, uh, nobody else has that unless you go down to Portland. And so that could end up, in fact, almost certainly will end up having the negative effect in that we'll just never see those projects because they'll go somewhere else where they can do it without that inclusionary zoning. So that's an example of uh, a tool or a tactic, a leverage that's out there to try and get more affordable housing in your community. But I think it really needs to be in the context of what is the community, all the, the development community also wanting to know and wanting to hear and wanting to, to learn about our community as, as a place to do their project. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of give and take. And I think that's probably one of the better things that we can do is to put flexibility into our zoning so that yeah. we can have some conversations instead of, no, you have to meet this or forget it. Right, but I think this all comes down to one big issue. We created a product called Freeport everybody wants to live in. And we haven't built many houses. Right. The supply and demand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You need to build the supply. 
I mean, that's really what this comes down to. So how do we build that supply? <clears throat> I don't think there has to be a lot of, if you want to do that, we have to do this. I don't know how you reconcile that, but I think it's growth. We need more housing stock, pure and simple. It's not that complicated. Well, but I think where it does get complex is that we need the right varied type of housing stock. And I, I don't have a firm grasp on what those numbers look like because I don't think we set that as part of the visioning. And I think that we'd be well suited to take a step back and figure out what that mix looks like because if not, we're never gonna hit a, a target that we want. We're just gonna, whoever comes to us with the next development, we'll just have to weigh that, do we want this development or not? Versus here's where we wanna be in 10, 15 years, how do we get there? I think those are two vastly different things and I don't have a good sense that we're poised to really make a data-driven decision on this. That's just where I'm sitting and if people feel differently, you know, I welcome the, the dialogue, but that's what I'm struggling with. Mm -hmm. Jake? Yes, <laughs> struggling too. Um, one thing I would like to hear talking points of, I guess, or a question that I have is, what do you tell the people who are like, hey, the school system at Mass Landing is already overrun and we have the superintendent or principals teaching because we don't have any people there and you want to add what? More housing? And then they start to say things like, oh, and my property's worth a half a million dollars, and when we add all this housing, what's it gonna be worth? So these are things that people are asking me that I would like input on, because you know I, I sit here and I understand what we need and I, I get it. It's taking all of those hours of conversations and saying, yeah. here's the, my 30 second we, elevator the speech. The school issue is an enormous, enormous yeah. issue, because our my wife works at the elementary school here and it's busting at the seams. They've got 100 more kids than they had two years mm -hmm. ago. And that's what the parents are telling me because I teach martial arts and I'm with all those parents and they're like, what's going on? Yeah. So if we're going to add housing, yeah, we, we have, have to increase the schools. So that's what we have to decide. What does the town of Freeport yeah. want to do? Yep. And I've, I've also had this. You can do yeah. that. I mean, it's a sliding scale. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the other one that gets left out quite a bit is, you know, my poor aunt who lives down on Flying Point, who in, unfortunately, or fortunately, it depends how you look at it, but she's on a fixed income and she owns 16 acres on the water. And right now she's paying $18,000 a year and I don't know how she does it. So every time we go in, and as Peter said, uh, you know, the majority of that stock and there's property on either side of her, and one's going on the market for 1.8, uh, there's another talk coming in that's gonna be close to a million dollars and that's just gonna raise that more. You know, I know the state has pa passed an issue here, and, and you know, I, I was blessed. Both of my kids live in town. You know why they're living in town? Because we had a family farm that was capable of them going there. Now, my five grandkids, I don't know where they're going to go. I would hope that they could be here, but, you know, you're exactly right. It, we, we can't bring uh, uh, the working class into this community to buy property to build, build a home. It's a very complex issue and uh, you know you know how she got money to pay her taxes she worked until how old for us yeah she worked for town freeport as, she as, a, as doing labor as a town employee until 81 years old yeah. to afford her you know mm. e exactly Pete. Uh, an extremely hard-working individual who had to work you know well, mm -hmm. yeah. it sounds like what we're saying though is we really want affordable homes you can buy right i mean that's what it's, you know, everybody's like, oh, I want my kids to live here, but they want their kids to own a house here that's affordable. Well, some people, some people want a place to rent because they're not ready yeah. to buy a house. Yep. Some people want a really small apartment. Some people want to move in with four people and they need a bigger apartment. So it's a whole array. So one, one array. data point to get at Matt's question, which I think is the exact right question, that we don't have the information. I talked just in a passing conversation with Mary and suggested that one bit of analysis they do is look at our existing, I mean, a real easy baseline. If you want Freeport not to change much from what it is now, I mean, I'm not saying our, our demographic in terms of income wise is correct, the mix, but if you don't want to uh, make it worse or make it, you know, in either direction, you take our existing demographic in terms of income, um, do that analysis. 
match it to our current housing stock using a standard, you know, how much percentage of your income you're supposed to be able to pay for for housing and say, hey, we don't meet because our current income spread, you know, and I, I'm not the right person to talk about what that's 20, 30 percent or whatever, can't afford the existing housing stock in Freeport on the recommendation. We are currently, everybody on the average in Freeport is paying more of their income towards housing than what the recommendation is for their income level. And we say, okay, so where do we need to add? Imagine now if it grows by 10% and you keep that mix the same, you just increase the mix by 10%. We're gonna need 10% more on this end, this end, this end, this end. But we can tell where we are now, I think where we're deficient and where we need to go if we grow. Um, you know, if we're already, if we've got, if we're great on the high end housing, we're marginally adequate on the upper middle, deficient on the lower middle and terribly lacking in the lower level of, for housing affordability, then we know where we need to focus middle, you know, lower middle and, and lower income. And we don't need to be building more luxury homes. doesn't mean people can't build a luxury home if they want to it just means our official policy should not be encouraging yeah. that they should be encouraging the development of the housing that we actually need to meet our current demographic spread, let alone the future growth. Mm -hmm. So I think anything that moves us away from those lower levels towards higher levels, typically referred to as gentrification, right? You're, make, you're pricing lower income demographics out of living in your town. So, I mean, that's not the way to do it, but that's kind of like how I'm envisioning saying, where are we now, where are we deficient, and what do we need to add to get to the correct level for our current housing spread? And then if that increases, we can always scale it. And I'm hoping part of the conversation too, like Jake was saying, I'm getting a lot of questions about it as well. And some of the questions I'm getting are, how do we do this and make the new developments as sustainable and environmentally friendly as we can with stretch codes and this and that? So we're layering on more expense. potentially expense or difficulty. <coughs> so so how, where, where do we, how do we balance what might be competing objectives so I, I don't expect there's an, answer, an easy answer, but I expect there's a lot of discussion. And the other piece, too, is um, it's, it's not a Freeport-only discussion in my mind. It's a regional discussion. It's a statewide discussion. So I think we're doing a yeoman's job of trying to address the issue. I, I'm hoping that our neighbors are as well. And how do we fare in, you know, next to Yarmouth and Thalmouth? And um, can we encourage them, or do we need to get, get up to speed to where they are? Um, so you know, broadening the discussion after the 20th, of course. But. Um, just a sort of logistical question. Do you want to do this as a workshop before the meeting so that we might get better participation at the risk of maybe time boxing it so that we could start our meeting on time? Or do you want to leave it at the end of the meeting? Because we've got a number of public hearings to do. Uh, yeah, right. We just set three or four of them for yeah, the Some of them are, are not expected to take a long time, but I know we've got parking yeah. and well, we got to this. I thought so. tonight was going to be much later, and we got to this item by, I'm by, I'm by I'm eight o'clock. Well <laughs> done, <laughs> man. Um, yeah, I'm not so taking Notice I stopped talking. <laughs> um, you stopped at 19 minutes. Um, yeah, I I don't know. I guess I'm, I'm open. I hadn't really thought about that where it goes in the agenda. Thoughts? You guys want to do a workshop first? Does it matter? I think we're just getting started in the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm kind of thinking we might, if, we're there, if it's more of a community conversation thing, I think we might get more if participation. Do it earlier. Yeah. It seems I'm the one that maybe threw a uh, rock in the cog here. Um, you know, if, could we start at 6.30 because I, no, and you know, no, because no, if no. people are coming here, yeah, I don't yeah. want to cut that short. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I, you know, do I, I guess, do we have the authority to say, okay, we're gonna do the workshop up front, schedule to 6.30, we'll start a meeting at 6.30. So that, I would rather see more time so to have that discussion. And I think more people may come in early. Start the workshop at six or start the workshop at 6.30? Uh, start, no, no. Start, 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 start earlier. Five or five thirty, and start our yep. meeting. Yep, and, and and give it a good amount of time. Yeah, no, that's yeah. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We you, have everybody else. The rest will start at six thirty. Yeah, I mean, you have the ability. The only thing, <clears throat> even if you don't have the ability, geez, sorry. The only thing you're breaking your own rules of order and procedure. So unless you're going to sue yourself in court, mm, yeah, or take action against know. yourselves, I think we're. I mean, a simple. Yep, we're all in I favor mean, of that. I, I think by going early and starting at six thirty, we'll. we'll <clears throat> More participation is which is what we want. Yeah. So so start a workshop, say at five thirty, start the 
council meeting at 6 30. and have an hour yeah and, and i would also it's good to have a timeline too like where it'll yeah. be an hour and it'll still yeah. be going yeah, yeah. But if we're going to take this seriously we're not getting anything done in an hour yeah. i mean this needs to be a serious like we need to figure out a plan <coughs> of how we're going to come to whatever consensus eventually we are listen to all the stakeholders i mean this is a this is the future of our town i mean if we don't do this right <coughs> yeah. mm -hmm. the visioning is i mean yeah. we can kiss it goodbye i mean we need to nail this one yep. so whatever steps we have to do to to get the data to make informed decisions to hear the voices of our community i think we need to do it so cool. whether that's a mm -hmm. longer road than people thought i think we need to get started should, should we set a goal for the 20th then to kind of figure out what the next steps are to have whether it's a working group or a day-long session or whatever it is well, i think we need to give the information right? yeah right. yeah and, and then after that we can decide sure. what yep right it's just and the how first much, how yeah much more information we need yeah yeah if we need exactly. if we need that or not yeah right. fair enough yep yep all right daryl many years ago peter and, I, and i'm the old guy here and i always bring up the past but we looked at condensed zoning on uh, that was west of the highway uh, and actually we were looking uh, at sprinkle buildings and bringing uh, the setbacks and if I remember right it was within 10 feet uh, but which brought up to the other issue when we go east of the tracks I've got to have two and a half acres down in, in my area so uh, you know we look at those requirements that we cur currently have and I think again maybe it's time we certainly won't cover there within an hour but we probably should have another time is our zoning accurate now when we set the two and a half acres what was the reasoning for that uh you know those are are some legitimate questions that you know we'll be looking at yep. we, we do have in the works a comprehensive plan so all the stuff we just did for downtown we're about to do for the rest of town yep. and that's i think going out to bid this fiscal year so we'll be starting that process which and i think that's exactly the kind of stuff they're going to look at yep. so yeah Two and a half acre zoning drives land prices, which are about a quarter or to a third of housing prices. So if you make it one and a quarter, one and a half acre zoning, one and a quarter acre zoning in place of two and a half acre zoning, I'm not saying to do this beside all of the irate people that would come and burn downtown hall with me in it. Um, you would have, you would reduce your land cost in theory by something close to half. Now, you do that town because you're going to drive you're going to make the supply of land almost double overnight no but not everybody's going to do it so it, right. the potential would Is be there, there but you're definitely like it's more of a gradual shift then. right yeah. and like my lot couldn't do that like because i don't have enough road frontage so like right. no but i have one that could become three for example like a lot like there are people that have and right now it's one building lot because it's like what 4.8 or something like that so it doesn't trip five but it would be you know, I, I'm saying that there are negatives to that, like, like the reduction of the rural character. But that's something that we need to weigh, and the entire town needs to weigh, what the preservation of this open space, right, is uh, costing us. It's driving housing prices. It's one of the things that drives housing prices. One up, of the so. dynamics that I want to make sure we don't lose sight of on the 20th is that if we do something like that, the private market is just going to come in instead of building one $600,000 house on the two and a half acres, two they're going to build three $600,000 houses yeah. on, on the one acre. That, and that and they'll happen. sell them like that. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to consider doing something with the zoning, I think we got to get something back. And so that's where we can sort of trade and say, okay, here's the zoning um, and we have an allowance that you could actually have a smaller lot but we want you to also build some houses that the people who work in this town can afford to buy. And so that's that's the kind of dynamic that I think it'll take a long time, but I think that's the kind of conversation that we might need to hammer out. Because the private sector isn't going to build affordable housing for us just because we say we want it. That's they're only true. going to do it if they're either required or if there's a, some kind of an incentive for them. Or there's enough housing stock that the prices come down, and then they have to build them <clears throat> for that market. I mean, well, it, that's it's, that, it, that's it, true in in more reasonable economic conditions, which I think we are far from right now. No, we 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 haven't because we've made those rules. That you have, because we've made those rules, 
you have to have a certain size lot, we have altered the way the market works. And so there's going to be a big correction if we do what we're doing. So we have to decide, do we yeah. want to have that correction or do we not? You know, it, it, it seems to be an either or. You can't have high housing prices and then affordable housing that's at a, a below a market because who's paying for that? I'm paying for it in my taxes. You know, I mean, there's, you, you, it's supply and demand. And there are a lot of questions we have to answer where we want to be on that, that market. But it's got, it's got to come down to what do we want to do as a, as a town? Yeah, I want to keep my property values high. Okay, then we, how, how do you get for Then we're not building anything. Then we're not building anything. Well, right. That's the problem, right, is that I think a lot of people out there are going to say, I'm quite happy the prices have gone up a lot because now when I want to sell, yeah. I'm going to make a lot of money. And if yeah. before they sell, we say, oh, just kidding, we're going to slash it by a quarter, that's going to make people very upset. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a fine line. That's why I said work. they'd burn the town hall down it, with me inside. It might. Right. It might, but you never know. I mean, yeah. Yeah. well, you know, just because we split up, I got four acres. If we make it an acre a piece, well, now my, my house still worth the same, but now I got three other acres I can sell, and that's not going to reduce that price mm -hmm. at all. It just makes it that it's, oh, I got three acres that I can sell now, and I, that can... In theory, most people would have land that they could sell as a result. Even if the land is worth less, you get... Each acre is worth less, but as a whole, my right. property price has not changed, so... But, yep, they may choose to say, if I keep my house on four acres, I can sell it for more money, or I can keep the value up and not... Reset. Right. Yeah. So yeah. it, <clears throat> my guess is there's the land a, isn't going anywhere, and the price isn't really changing. It's just what I can do with the land that's changing. Right. Uh, yeah, we're not going to sell this in an hour. No, we're not. <laughs> but, but but that's yeah. The, we'll start the conversation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Put it this way: no matter what you choose to do, oh, yeah, 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 there's going to be yeah. angry people right. involved. Yeah. Even if you do nothing, there will be angry people. If you do something, there will be an equal amount of angry people. So, welcome to town this politics. Is, this is not an easy subject for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. All right. So, we're going to start a workshop at 5:30 on the 20th. We'll go for an hour, and then we'll do our regular council meeting with right. all of its public hearings. Can so we write this into the council goals for next year? Can we just do that right now? Because that time's going to come up. We're going to say, what are our council goals for next year? And I'm going to say, I have no idea. Forget what we did. Affordable housing. Yep. Can we just write it in now? I'm hopeful Can we just that. say housing? Or can we add it to or, our or, special list or something? Right. What housing. kind of housing do we want? But yeah, to determine what kind of housing we want and encourage it, yeah. We, it's one of the uh, outcomes that I'm, uh, is coming out of that downtown vision uh, suggestions that we're going to talk about in the next couple of weeks. Um, one of them has to do with housing, encouraging more housing. Uh, we don't get specific in terms of affordable or not. Uh, but yes, I we're very much support doing some council goal workshop stuff uh, in November, December this year. So that's my intention anyway. Uh, we got one thing left on the agenda. Thank, um, thank you all for being open to the subject. It's been a long time. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for. <laughs> it's a discussion we need to have because it's been batted around but it's, and it's not it's happening and everyone we need more affordable house. okay well let's figure out how to what fix it, it without putting a whole lot of rules into place that do you have some accessibility updates to talk to us about unlike some people i'll do this in 10 minutes instead of 15. did we already hear that <laughs> did we hear that tonight <laughs> famous last words an hour later you'll be throwing stuff at me um yeah and i, I mean i'll i'll walk through this really quickly there's a few things that i'm kind of a little bit proud of here that i want to show off the town staff have been doing um and i'll won't take any credit because most of there's a lot of town staff involved here that did a, a heck of a job um it's a nice memo that you sent. yeah i it, it was nice when i sat down and started putting stuff together what was actually what actually came up um this is about yeah i know I'm, i don't have anything to show right now so i'm going to show you white screen um this is about one half of uh, the project. These are public properties, improvements that we're doing, continuing to do, continuing to find issues, little issues, but they're popping up everywhere. Um, I'll get into that a little bit. Um, these are the things that are going to generate the most interest, the most concern from residents if they're not addressed because they are public buildings that are publicly accessible. There is also the portion of private buildings that are publicly accessible. Um, so that includes existing businesses that have um, accessibility issues or great accessibility and it also 
uh, includes new construction um, that needs to comply 100% with existing accessibility rules. So anything that's renovated above a certain threshold needs to comply with ADA standards um, for commercial properties. Not everything that's existing, depending on timing, depending on you know use, change of use, things like that, does comply. Um, everything should comply, but not everything is actionable if it doesn't comply for private property that's publicly accessible. Um, I'm gonna talk about that a little bit separately. I've been working with our codes department and our planning department to go over the processes they use for both new construction and change of use, renovation, things like that. Um, and there's some pretty good ones, both at our level and at the state level. It doesn't catch 100% of things, but I think I'm comfortable saying they catch 80 to 90% of issues before they're even put in the ground. Um, and there's a lot of them that are caught. So I'm not gonna get into specifics with individual, oh, like Joe came in and his building was a wreck and we fixed him good. Um, that's not the goal. The goal is to show the processes and the different levels of review. I'll do that separately. Um, with them and that'll be included in kind of a final list of all this information um, and the last thing i want to say is we've been focusing on accessibility for really the last it started five six years ago here with town properties but really the past two to three years there's been broadening of it to a, a, a much larger scope of town employees so um, our buildings and grounds you know uh, maintenance folks for example are under the working order that they build um, Picnic tables, right? We go through them on a regular basis at all different town facilities. So they build accessible tables only. Doesn't mean they all go in accessible locations, but the standing order is just build an accessible table. Eventually all the non-accessible ones will be broken and they'll be replaced. Now the goal is to make where those go also accessible um, through improvements, but there's steps. Um, and there's just been a lot of buy-in public works, buildings and grounds, different department directors who run facilities, um, as they learn, they become more interested in finding the problems in their own property, which is really cool to see. And the, the last thing I'll say before I go through the individual properties is a new focus over the past couple of years, I'm really excited about, um, and it makes a lot of sense when you explain it to people, but universal kind of accessibility, meaning you build the same feature for everyone to use and moving away from the, you know, yeah, yeah, like you have to, um, out here is a perfect example, and I'll get into that in town, the town hall building, but you've got a set of steps, and then there's kind of like this ramp that's over to the side that's it was never really done right. It's shoddy, and it's got weird right angles to it. And, but it was so, you know, yeah, we're accessible. It's like, yeah, but it's a whole separate experience. And that's what people have been saying for years and years and years in the disabled community is like, just build the ramp central that everybody uses that's not gonna, it's gonna take up a little more space, but you then you don't have to build two facilities, right? Or so eliminate like- eliminate the need for the ramp. Right, like that kind of universal design, like with picnic tables, like why are you building two sets? Like people do that. They're like, oh, build an accessible table and a non-accessible table. It's just like, spend the extra $5 on the wood and just right. have it overhang. So kind of implementing those things as we go, now there's, those happen on new facilities and new construction and things like right. that. So it'll take a long time to work through all, you know, but a hundred years from now, if that, is the guiding principle. Every facility in town will be, you know, our successors, successors will have perfectly accessible everything that you can't even tell the difference. So, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe it won't even be, maybe it won't even be an issue there with, you know, with biologics and things like that. I don't know. Um, so just a couple of these projects that we've been working on last year and this year, um, we mentioned when, uh, Dunning Boatyard, sorry, at the beginning of the meeting. And, uh, this is, there you go. That's last fall. Um, looks great. Yeah. Um, this is what it is now. And I didn't get a good picture panned to the right of the um, of the the parking facility, but it's all clean with guardrails uh, delineating where the parking is. And this is something we picked up in the design process. It's already impervious, so why not put an actual ADA um, compliant parking space there? There's a picnic area that's laid out, so why not make it accessible? You'll see there are the overhang picnic tables for uh, for wheelchair use underneath and compatible mulch, which is not great, but it works. So um, ideally this would be paved, however we can't mm -hmm. pave there, it's gotta be mulched and it's gonna grow in. Because it's so close to the water. It's like 10 feet off the water. So um, it's ultimately gonna grow in up to where the picnic tables are on the bank and all that, and then there might be some chance of putting stone dust paving down or something like that. But right now it's gonna remain mulched. So 
that's something we're going to work on. Something going forward, it was also mentioned over here, the, uh, that idea of a finger float. So one of the reasons, I didn't get into this when we were talking about it, but one of the reasons we kind of held off is, is there a way to make that float and the ramp access accessible? Um, the, I mean, the ramp is the ramp. We can't change a ramp angle for boats, but is there a way to make the actual float to get up and get into the boat accessible? So that might be a little bit extra, cost a few extra dollars, but hey, it's worth looking at. If then we can have, you know, maybe we pave a path over to there and put that float in and make it a completely accessible, or as accessible as you can get on a boat launch. So those are kind of the conversations we're having at both the, the public works and the engineering in my level. So, yeah. I have a stupid question. Why don't you call it Porter's Landing? Yeah, I think it's actually It's at Porter. I know right? uh, that that's yeah, Porter's Nicole Landing. Road. The property historically was owned by the Dunnings. It's right. Dunning oh, yeah. Boatyard. That's who the town bought the property from. Daryl, you've got oh, the history. Uh, he, yeah, so, so. But it was the Dunnings who ran that yeah, facility. Dunning ran a boat last week. Shop and lived there. Yeah. What? So that's why it's called the Dunning. But everyone but it's at Porter's Landing. The, the geographical so location is Porter's Landing. The property is known colloquially yeah. as Dunning. So the town so owns the boat. The, yeah. the, the, the building, too. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know. No one at all. Yeah. What are we doing with the building? We're leasing. We're running it. Good question. We can talk about that at the facilities committee. Right. Yeah. So, so that's, so that's one. That's just one small part of like a small project that, because people were like, hey, other department heads and myself were like, hey, we're doing this project. What's the accessibility situation? Look at the project. Zero. It's like great. Well, if we can make a portion of this facility accessible, a picnic area a parking area. I mean, people are still gonna be able to use this as well on the dirt. It's not gonna, we can't advertise it as having the ramp meet ADA at this point, but it's usable if, you know, right. it's still hard pack. It just doesn't quite meet the ADA surfacing requirements or the ramp requirements. So it's getting there, right? And when we redo the finger float, maybe we can make the whole thing, the whole shindig be accessible. So that's- When, when you redo the finger float, look into a, Lower float, yeah. that'd be more appropriate for kayaks or rowboats. That's the idea, and that's yeah, why yeah, we yeah. haven't just, that's why the idea, oh, can we just plop the old one that was back there? It's like, no, we right. do this, it's gotta be done right, it's gotta be done something usable, and also something that's accessible to the greatest extent we can make it. So that's also gonna mean the top of it's not gonna be just slat, slat, yeah. slat, it's gonna have to be matted or something like that. Much like Winslow Park, so this is a really cool one. Um, Winslow Park's been doing some improvements over the past couple of years, they've been doing, um, uh, replacing all their picnic tables with accessible picnic tables, accessible fire rings for actual accessible designated campsites. We have accessible shower stalls, uh, shower facilities that are held separate um, uh, for those users. We are looking at, I know that Neil's looking at putting paved accessible parking right immediately in front of those shower stalls to really increase their accessibility. and. There's this project, which was uh, started about, really about three years ago conceptually, four years ago conceptually, three years ago planning, two years ago design, constructed this year. There's a concrete ramp, um, beachfront construction, and we matted the top of it because interestingly, the concrete that was specced and was built um, is not, has those furrows in it like a plank, like a concrete plank system would be, so this is an unfortunate after the fact, Matt, that actually works, but it's also the same as, this is 180 degrees, this right picture is 180 degrees from the bottom of that ramp. So just turning around, and this is, there's a concrete pad where I'm standing, taking the picture looking up, and then taking the picture down to the water, and there's another mat that actually rolls out at low tide into the water, so people can get down into the water. Um, and this is gonna be used with both our existing beach chair, which they've had for some years there, um, which is available on request. And this brand new chair that they picked up, which is fantastic, which is actually a float chair um, that can be used on those, either on the sand or on those mats to get down into the water. And I actually saw this being used, there's one at Popham Beach, and I saw it being used, um, actually the beach chair being used this week by some folks, it looked like it was working really good there. So. Um, the beach technically would be accessible with this beach chair here, but there was not an easy way to get down there with the grade. So that's what the ramp project uh, took care of. There's gonna be another phase two of this project that's gonna be starting this fall, and that's gonna be adding paved accessible parking directly across the street from where this ramp is, where the boat ramp area is um, in that parking lot by the main entrance, and then a sidewalk and a crosswalk and signage 
for an accessible pathway. So they need to do some of the paving down there anyways. It's going to make sense. We're going to be able to designate it, do it all as one project, um, and completely funded by Winslow Park dollars to do that. So um, pretty cool, pretty cool upgrades there. So it's been that's been a little bit of a challenge. A few things have come up during that project, um, but I think Neil's rolled with it. He's done a pretty good job so far. So I just hope it'll finish out really well. <clears throat> Community center parking lot, this is an interesting one. Um, we don't own this parking lot, but we have a shared use lease with the community center for use of this parking lot. Um, and we're actually responsible for capital improvements on it, 22 55ths or 40% of the cost, and community center is responsible for 60% of the cost, 55, uh, 33 55ths. I don't know, they're 55 spots, they just, did it somehow for some reason like that. So, um, so we don't own it. That normally would stop us from working on it. But Sarah from the community center said, "Hey, what can we do in this?" I said, "Well, let's go over." Earl and I went over. We did a consult. Earl measured it out. Did some markings. The existing lot. Um, this the right hand picture gives you the best orientation. That's like looking directly at the town hall. If you continued where that. Um, path went up the hill we're right kind of where those trees are behind so there was an existing parking space here that was signed that was marked as accessible there were no there was no loading or unloading stall there was nothing other than just a marking it was an eight foot by 18 foot parking space so did not meet dimensional standards this space right here um, was eight by 18 as well or eight by 19 or 18 and a half or whatever and with no loading stall just a marking on the ground and a sign did not meet dimensional requirements and they were in two separate locations. Um, while we were sitting here talking with Sarah for about 15 minutes in the parking lot going over some different configurations we could restripe for them. Um, over here, somebody was parked here and a, a, a nice lady, I've seen her down there before, uses the center a lot, was walking out kind of slowly in between her car and the disabled parking space and the spot next to it and somebody came around the corner this way at about 20 miles an hour you know not on two wheels but skipping a you know skipping a little hip hip as they went around and Earl and I just said well that's not going to work like there's no visibility for there's two lanes one coming this way one coming this way it makes a horseshoe and there's no visibility so people were essentially unloading without a stall next to them and then kind of just like hoping no one's coming around that corner you know a kid or you know an unsafe driver at a high rate of speed so we put our heads together and there are now two spots located here and this spot gives you a clear view in both directions as you kind of walk out to this part of the stall you can look right you get seen from all the way down that stall and you can look straight ahead and get seen all the way from down that circulation stall so really simple project about 500 dollars drastic improvements in actual complying with the requirements of the space so um, they bought the materials we did the labor worked out great this is an example of like a small low budget improvement that we need to make at several of our facilities and we have made at several of our facilities like our public works garage. They found this one on their own. Um, Earl said, oh, by the way, we had to restripe all of our parking in front of the office. It's like, what are you talking about? Goes, no, there was no ADA accessible parking in the entire building, in the entire facility. This was something that was built in the 90s, early 2000s. Um, great facility, but at the time, the town did not install any or review any accessible parking or require any accessible parking. So when you hear um, residents saying, hey, there's a history of buildings, things being done in Freeport, non-compliant, here's one that we were looking for these kind of things and we didn't even see it because it's kind of an industrial building that's off the side. Um, kudos to the Public Works Department employees who saw that and noted it and just did it. Um, this is an example of getting everyone involved in this process. They just fixed it on their own. Um, this is also the, the um, bus maintenance facility and the, where most of the drivers go to keep their buses. So there's also a good chance that we could have an employee in the future that needed those spots and there wouldn't be there. Um, so we don't, you know, there's nobody that needs it now, but odds are somebody someday, either one of our employees or a school district employee will. So um, another thing that's gonna be contemplated right off of, you can see there's a sign here, no entrance on these hours or something like that. So. The office is secured, um, so we need to figure out, hey, do you need a door opener? Do you need a buzzer? What do you need to do to make it entrance in? And we had the conversation with Earl, and, and he's like, yeah, actually, 
nobody should be coming in here when there's not somebody in the office because it's a restricted facility. There's times when there's nobody in the office. So we said like, well, you know, universal kind of accessibility, like why should any segment of the population have access? Like why should an able-bodied person be able to break the rules and go in without anybody there and a disabled person not, right? So it's like, hey, install the buzzer now. They're gonna put a door, a power door opener there in the future when needed. But it kind of like worked out like, yeah, everybody should be buzzing for entrance, not just somebody who needs assistance. So kind of looking at it at that universal, putting every user in the same category, just looking at everybody together and saying, okay, is there anybody that's gonna need access to this? Then everybody should have the same access to it. So um, that's, that's one that I really like. They just picked up on their own. So we've got a bunch of projects. You guys are well aware of the town hall one. I won't get into that, but if you remember this one entrance here that's on the side is the only at grade entrance um, and it's really just a junky ramp there. So it's gonna be a nice gradual main entrance. Everyone's gonna use the same ramp from both directions like a Y that's gonna go right up to the pad and then making the front exit right here also be accessible. So you'll be able to at grade right out into the gathering area out here and then also at grade onto the both of the sidewalk connections. So there'll be no stairs in the front of the building Everything will meet correct pitch and slope for paved surfaces and will be maintainable in the winter and all that kind of great stuff. So that's a fun one that I'm really happy with that that's moving forward. Hunter Road Fields, this is gonna be a big one in terms of actual work being done there. There's accessible parking that was all put in. I mean, this is 2011 we're talking about. All accessible parking, the correct amount, correct number, paved spots, correct stalls, signed, everything. And I think like two of the spots actually connect to a field. Everything else is on the other side of like drainage swales or grassy areas or something like that, that maybe some users might be able to, tra to traverse them even though they don't meet ADA requirements, but it definitely will stop some people from accessing those fields. This is a recent one that's like, how did that go through review? Well, it went through review and approval and getting built that way. So part of the the big overhaul project, it's not the medium overhaul project that Adam's working on, we need to get a uh, site location, a slaughter permit to modify any of the impervious there. So we're gonna do the parking lot and all of these accessible pathways um, from the ADA parking spaces, making them actually go to at least a point where you can watch a field. So, you know, over the drainage swale and up to, you know, a traversable surface like stone dust or pavement up to like a viewing area for the field for that you're playing at, for example, or that you have, say you've got kids, say you've got grandkids that are playing at it. Um, one of the ones that we noted were the baseball fields in the back, the clover leaf. Um, there's spots down there that you can't get to those backfields, really. Um, you can't get to the dugout area, so the idea is to put a hard pack or, or paved surface kind of like in the middle of the clover and a path going to it, so people would be able to use that location to watch a game going on at any of those fields. So just kind of thinking of it like, okay, why, you know, it's definitely a limiting factor. It's definitely at our facilities. Why are we not gonna fix that? Of course we're gonna fix that. So um, Adam's working on that. That'll be the pretty in-depth but not difficult project. It's gonna be a couple stream, you know, swale crossings and hard pack surface or pavement, right? Hard pack now and pavement later. Either will meet ADA if they're done correctly. So um, last but not least, public safety building. This is a fun one. The um, not fun, terrible. <laughs> the, um, the stall in between the parking spaces, there's the unloading stall, but just like there's no curb tip down at the sidewalk. So there's a barrier right there and you have to unload, go out and around your parking space and up the, the ramp that's there. It's just like, it's not, it's the same distance, but why did you put the tip down into the parking lot where, I mean, anybody not using a mobility aid could step over a curb, you would put the tip down where the unloading stall is and the, and the hard curb where the walking population goes, not vice versa. There's a nice tip down, it's just, you have to go spot. like this. Yeah, I mean, it's just done backwards, so. You move the spot? Right, is it easier to move the spot? It's not, because you'd, you'd have to make a accessible route behind the parking. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, no, no, we couldn't, that, that would have been great. Um, it just, you, you'd have to make a striped area behind your car and they'd have to be out in traffic. You Literally, yeah. low risk to make it that way, but still not ideal. You put people onto the sidewalk instead of out into the, the travel lane. Um, that's how people are doing it now. So anybody that goes there is gonna see the tip down and they're gonna be like, oh great, I just wheel out into the 
the actual travel lane, which is not safe, and up up the tip down when the tip down should just be at the more accessible location. So small fix. It's not like the building's inaccessible. It's just it's not the ideal safety setup, and it's not ADA compliant. It doesn't meet the parking dimensional standards. Yeah, yeah they're literally going to just excavate it, and then re they'll have to, when we've got another paving, like a small handwork paving contract, they'll just do it then and repave that small section, so some curbing. That's another example that an employee, a, a line level employee saw and said, like, hey, isn't this supposed to be like, yeah, good catch. Like, so that's the kind of level of, that I'm really excited to see from the employees catching on and seeing these things. So that's town facilities. We're gonna have like probably a lot more like that public works and the public safety one that we kind of see, you know, over the coming couple of years as we look at this more. But the big thing is also doing, we're working with businesses. I'll try to quantify some of that and get information, put this up on a web page with a list of the projects. So I've already told staff we're gonna work on that and just some of the processes. And also if you see something, you know, what you can do to report it, Things like that. So, well so. done. Nice to have a few yeah. Of yeah, we're trying. Yeah. Thank you. Pass that on to all the folks who are involved. Thank you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I make a motion to end the meeting. Second. Like all in favor? Aye. All right. We're adjourned at uh, eight fifty-six. Isn't that what happens when I...